fall of a school committee will now come to order. Uh, pursuant to the open meeting law, any person who may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and are even acknowledged and permissible. If we can have a salute to the flag, oh, excuse me, a roll call, please. Mr. Agnew? Here. Mr. Coogan? Yep. Mr. Costa? Here. Mr. Hetzler? Here. Mr. Corey? Here. Mr. Martin? Here. Mayor Correa? Here. And now a salute to the flag. Is that off the whole time? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag. Okay, we have a number of recognition awards this evening, and in the interest of time, I'm going to take the recognition awards. So we'll do that now. Okay, Just join me at the at the bottom. Thank you all. Hello. I guess not. There it is. Uh, thank you all. Um, we're going to be doing some awards, and I'm going to just announce some of the school committee members that are going to uh, read the nominations and honoring these great people that have done great work for the city of Fall River. So first up is school committee member Paul Coogan. Okay, uh, it's a privilege for me to. Um, sorry. It's a privilege for me to introduce my um, good friend Kristen Garvin and the whole crew's over there with her husband Paul. Um, there's a number of reasons I selected Kristen to get a, uh, a Fall River Pride or School Award, whatever we're calling it, this week. My position is she's tackled the Alumni Association. She sat at one of the soccer games when it was about three below zero, uh, selling Durfee gear. She has about 120 young people in Fall River for the last two summers learning the fundamentals of track and field while well, she runs a track and field camp in the evenings at Durfee a couple of nights a week. And especially for what she did uh, for the Fall River Public Schools on the vote, yes, she was out there every single night grinding it out phone calls, community meetings over and over again. I know she gave me a kick in the backside to get me moving and I can't thank her enough for being the spark that helped light that yes vote. And with that, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Kristen Garvin. Let's get another nice round of applause for Kristen Garvin. And next I'd like to call upon school committee man Tom Corey for the next award. This award goes out to um, one of our, last year he was a first year teacher in the Fall River Public Schools. and. Um, He's a classic example of someone who was successful in another career that a later in life chose to come into education. And he came into education at a time uh, and he remained idealistic and he, he poured his heart and soul into his classroom and after school activities. And uh, as a career musician, he shared his talents with his students and would stay after school two times a week and have sessions with the kids um, with guitars and bass and drums and original music. So he opened the doors of creativity in their mind and their own imaginations and their own hopes and dreams. Um, that concept grew into bridging 
the children's activity at Durfee High School, along with a, a teacher in educator formed band. Uh, we have a bunch of educators at Durfee who are talented musicians and uh, for civic functions and for, for the sake of the schools. Um, we perform every once in a while at school and uh, bridging that, it, the, the concept became known as the Ellsbury Street Bridge. And I want to hand out this award to last year's first year social studies teacher at Durfee High School, to Nathan Jazak for his commitment to our public schools and for his enrichment in so many young students' lives. And for the next award, I'm going to call upon Dr. Dunn. Good evening. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I nominated a, um, a friend to all of us at Fonseca. She has been our PTO president for the last few years. She has worked tirelessly on behalf of not only the 80 plus staff, but the seven plus, 700 plus students. She, um, she worked in the cafeteria last year and the year before, but now we're so happy that she is here in a, as, in a paraprofessional position in our pre-K classroom. She goes above and beyond every single day for every single one of us. So I'm very happy to announce that Rose Braga has received this school committee award. One more round of applause for Mrs. Braga. And for the last award, uh, Dr. Malone's gonna present, thank you. All right, so this award's gonna go to a student, one of the very best students that we have. Best because he's kind and gentle and just a good all around person. Ty's number one passion in life is basketball. I'm talking about Ty Sean Lopes. He's sitting right here in front of me. His number one passion is basketball. He's been a starting varsity point guard for the past three years of the Durfee High School basketball team. He's looking forward to this year, which we just started his senior season, uh, and he wants everyone to know they need to come to at least one game this year. Now, Ty's become involved with the unified basketball team, which, for those of you who don't know, is a combination of our uh, varsity basketball players and other students and students in our community-based special education classroom. Uh, and as a friend, he works with those students to help develop uh, their love for basketball and their skills. Uh, and he experiences uh, the trials and tribulations of a team just like uh, all the other students. And through this work, working with students in our uh, sub-separate classrooms, uh, he now wants to become a teacher. Uh, and we all know as teachers and educators, it's that kind of work that drives all of us. There's one connection we had when we were younger, and all of a sudden we want to go into education. Uh, he is a man of simple tastes. His favorite food is a cheeseburger, fresh off the grill. Uh, he loves cheeseburgers more than anyone else in Fall River. At least that's what he says. Uh, he's developed numerous relationships with members of the Durfee team, and that's also what this work is all about. Uh, Ms. Fellows, our freshman guidance counselor set the bar high though. Uh, he recognizes her as the one person who's helped him most through his four years of high school. Uh, looking back at his high school experience, he recognizes that he could have done more. He wished he worked harder uh, uh, academically when he started his career. Now that's something we all find, am I right? All right, uh, but now he's ready to go to college. And he knows that, at, that after college, he wants to become a physical education teacher or an athletic director. So we gotta watch out for Coach Guimond or Mr. Buston because 
he's coming after you. Uh, really what's unique about Ty, Ty, uh, Ty is that he also volunteers uh, during the off season and all the camps in Fall River, not just the camps that Durfee runs, but also that the district attorney runs. Uh, his uh, senior class vice president uh, says that his work uh, with students in the school has been a role model to all other students to try to commit and do the same type of work. And then finally, I just want to say unsolicited uh, at the uh, day of the Durfee Day pep rally, uh, Ty showed up in uh, one of the special needs classrooms with a Durfee D and gave it to another student that never uh, uh, won a Durfee D. But he didn't just get that from the athletic director, it was his Durfee D. So he gave his own Durfee D to someone else less fortunate, and that's the reason why we want to recognize him for being an outstanding person, a member of our school committee. If we could just have all the uh, award recipients right in the middle for a photo, Dr. Malone will organize it. And let's get one more nice round of applause for Ty Lopes. Great job. Okay. Well, once again, congratulations to all the recipients. You're more than welcome to stay, but if you don't want to stay, you don't have to stay. Have a great, uh, great time and a great night. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on, next we have our citizen input time. We have one person signed up for citizen's input, and that's Colin Dias of 50, what is this, 560 Ray Five, Street. Six zero, Mr. Mayor. 560 Ray Street, open meeting law complaint is the topic. Greetings, Mayor Carrera, members of the Fall River School Committee. I come before you today to address um, one specific open meeting law complaint that was submitted. The reason I believe Mayor Correa violated the open meeting law multiple times at the last meeting is because he can no longer concentrate in even running a meeting effectively and in concurrence with the open meeting law. This is because he is faced with 13 federal indictments with possibly more to come. And it looks like he is in court every other week now. In one of my open meeting law complaints, I suggested that my complaint be rectified by having this com school committee declare no confidence in its chairman, a person accused of multiple felonies by a federal agency. What member of this committee will stand up for our city and let this mayor know his conduct is no, one, no longer welcome in our city, a city where one can make it here? I request that this committee, during the time of pro proposed executive session, discuss that specific open meeting law complaint, which calls for the no confidence vote in open session and declare no confidence in Mayor Jaisal Correa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is the superintendent's report. Sure. Uh, tonight I just wanna uh, share information regarding the, uh, the New Durfee construction update. We wanna inform the community, that, uh, the committee and the community that work is underway in parking lots B and C. Drainage in these areas is being installed now. 
These parking lots will be, be, will be paved on December 20th. These two parking lots will be turned over to the school around the first of the year when parking lots B and C are turned over. So that means that Suffolk will take over the main parking lot at that time and those two new satellite parking lots will be used by the school community. Just so you know and that you see, you can see the very intensive water retention systems that have been put in place uh, in both of those parking lots. And that's really what the bulk uh, of the work is. Also right now, underground utility work uh, has begun and coordination has been ongoing with the city engineers, National Grid, uh, Liberty Gas, Verizon, and Comcast. And you know, if you've seen, that the poles are now being moved to the other side of Ellsbury Street, and those will be hooked up once all those poles uh, are installed. The excavation of the building foundation has begun this week. This operation entails removing structurally unsuitable soils from the footprint of the building and replacing it with good materials. This operation will generate a lot of trucking inbound and outbound from the project and the trucking routes have been reviewed with the city to minimize traffic impact. And most of these trucks will come in and out via Langley. And finally, the historic Durfee Bells have been removed from the bell tower. Uh, the bells are now in secure storage and will turn when they're ready to be installed in the new building. The bell tower monument will be relocated to parking lot C area in the spring. Uh, and these operations have been coordinated with the Historic Bells Committee. Uh, I encourage uh, members of the committee, if they have not seen it, to go by uh, and see the, the scope of the work I was out this morning. It's absolutely uh, incredible. It's a massive undertaking. Uh, but most impressive is that we've built this uh, uh, man-made pond, which drains out the water, as you see us doing the, the, uh, the, uh, the water retention work. And I, we really feel... Uh, uh, amazing of how well the, the teams have been working. So we know that Suffolk is the, is the, is the, uh, is the construction manager, but local company Resendez has been doing the, a lot of the site work and very impressive with their uh, work ethic and we're thankful to all the construction folks uh, and everyone involved in this project. Thank you, Superintendent. May Mr. I? Vice Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may, through the chair to Dr. Malone. Last week, I forget what, forget what day it was, it might have been Tuesday or Wednesday, I was there for a um, winter sports parent meeting, and that main parking lot was in darkness, and I understand now that utilities have been taken down because of the construction and relocation of poles, but if it hasn't been rectified, is it possible to talk with Suffolk or one of our vendors to see if they can put temporary lighting in the evening so that while the student athletes are leaving the field house, that that lot is illuminated, you know, basically what was left in there was car headlights. And so students were coming and getting in vehicles all over that lot. And it was, you know, it, it had the potential for, for, you know, for an incident to occur. And I don't know if it's been addressed. I don't know if they can put, you know, generated, a, a generator run like they do on the highways with the lights for a couple of hours in the evening just so that students can get out of the building. So, um, not at the hours change, it's dark in there, and that would be my concern. So we've, uh, the, um, the construction committee has had those conversations about uh, temporary light. Suffolk's going to be doing that also with new signage as well that, that's uh, re uh, with reflection and et cetera to make sure it's totally safe. Yeah, I, I, I gauged it was probably due to the ongoing construction now. The utilities were taken down, but like I said, there were a number of students from different teams leaving the field house, going into vehicles, and it was, a lot was in darkness, so just figured if we could pass that along to Suffolk, if they could work on a plan to, at least for a couple hours, I know it would probably be noisy if they were generators, and we want to be sensitive to our, to our neighbors there, but at least for those couple of hours while students are leaving, if lights could be put on so that they can get in and out of the building safely, that would be great. With that, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next we have the student comments slash delegation report. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just here to provide more updates about the occurrences going on at Durfee High School. So I have a couple of bullet points ready, prepared to go, and I'm hoping that. So first of all, I just wanted to mention that there are two young ladies in our school that are taking the initiative to tackle 
a very daunting task, and one of them's actually over there recording right now. But I gotta shout her out because her and another girl from our school, Amaya Travasos, have prepared and started to run a club called College Readiness Club, which is designed to help aid seniors and upcoming juniors and even the younger class students at Durfee prepare for the, the task of applying to college. And it's not an easy task, so we know that having guidance from some of the best students in our school, people who other students should look up to, I think that's definitely something worth addressing, and I know that they're going to do great. Um, so we just recently received our first order of I Am Fall River t-shirts, which I had spoken about, and I have been trying to publicize over social media and get them around the city to try and get people to buy, and before I knew it, after three or four days, we were basically already sold out. So we just restocked our shirt count, and we have 75 more shirts coming in, and so they're $15, and the image portrays the words, I'm Fall River on it, and then there's a battleship, and then in the background, we have the Braga Bridge silhouette. And really, the purpose of this shirt came from one of the teachers in our school who posted something in a group chat just talking about how great the city is and how poor our reputation may be, but when we actually look at it and think about our city as a whole, that Fall River is actually a pretty special place. And as we're trying to repair the image of not only our school, but also the city, we felt that designing a t-shirt that showed Fall River Pride would do that. Um, next up, I wanted to mention a program that I'm taking the initiative to start on. And after soccer ending, I found myself with some free time. So I'm hoping to get a club slash program going called Tutors for Toppers. And I'm looking to speak with some of my senior friends who have the time to give. And what we really want to do is speak with those students who have been struggling in class or who might not be getting the desired grades. And we want to collaborate with them and meet them and tutor them and mentor them so that we can help them be the best students that we can be. And we hope that we can empower not only those students, but appeal other students to come to these meetings and help get a mentor so that we can assist them in reaching their desired grades. And last but not least, as the, the holidays approach, our student government team has taken on the task of trying to organize a clothing drive to just get together and have people from all over the school, the district, and the city donate clothes or toys or something where we can give them to the less fortunate. And hopefully, we can get that underway by Christmas time. But if not, we definitely want to run this throughout the whole entire winter. So with that, I yield. Thank you. Next, we have the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. OK, roll call, please. Question. Question Comment. on the approval of the minutes, Mr. Yeah. Aguilar. It's not uh, necessarily a question as much as I think it should be the policy of the committee to not have hard copies of these sent out in this day and age of emails. And I think we're wasting a lot of paper every month. So without a formal vote of the committee, I think people are trying to be cooperative and you know give us the information. But ultimately, I'd like to make a motion that we do all the minutes electronically to the committee, unless a specific committee member chose otherwise, we would get them a hard copy. So I'd like to make that in the form of a motion to give direction to the secretary and the superintendent. Is there a second? Second. Any objectors? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No? Okay. Unanimously passed. Thanks. Thank you. Roll call on the approval of the minutes. Mr. Agnes. Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Mayor Correa? Yes. Next is some travel requests. There are motion to approve. approve. Motion to approve all travel requests. Is that seconded? Second. Second. Seconded. Roll call, please. Mr. Aguiar? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. There are a number of donations. Is there a motion to approve on accept all donations? Motion to approve. Motion to approve has been made. Is there a second? Second. Question? No. Okay. Roll call. Mr. Aguia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Superintendent, can you please read the donations? Sure. Uh, Durfee High School uh, requests the acceptance of a donation of $5,555.84 from Maple for personalized learning. Resiliency Prep Academy. Uh, Requests a donation of $2,500 from Bay Coast Bank. Henry Lewis Community School accepts a donation of $832 from Diane Kozak and Eileen Gilroy. 
Sylvia Elementary School accepts a donation of $500 from New England Food and Dairy Council. Morton Middle School also accepts a donation of $500 from the New England Food and Dairy Council. Durfee High School accepts a donation of $219.56 from Donors Choose. Letourneau Elementary School accepts a donation of $100 from AC Moore. Durfee High School accepts a donation of $83.80 from Ohio Pile Prince Incorporated. And Durfee High School accepts a donation of $62.47 from Pell Industries Incorporated. Thank you. Thank you. There are a number of contracts for our approval this evening. Point of order. Yes, Mr. Martins. Hold on number two and number three. Hold on number two and number three. Okay. Any others to hold? All right. Motion to approve all the other contracts. So moved. Second. Second. Is uh, roll call. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Mr. Martins, you have the floor on item number two, which is American Institutes for Research. On, on item number two, the American Institute of Research uh, contract totaling $24,000 to provide mentoring sites uh, uh, for visits to uh, uh, the Fonseca Elementary School. Uh, the next sentence is what bothers me. This service is required as part of the uh, SRG grant for the Fonseca School. Um, uh, I read it, I'm being told that, well, this tells me uh, that it's supposed to be, but where's the proof of this? Why can't that money be utilized for something else, like adding a para, another paraprofessional? Can you respond to Mr. Martins? All right, uh, Mr. Martins, this is the, uh, this is a level four school, uh, the Fonseca Elementary School. Uh, it's in statute uh, that there is uh, intensive intervention uh, with schools identified as level four. Uh, so part of the school redesign grant process, we sign on that we will have yearly monitoring site visits. This is the same process that uh, Watson just went through for the last four years. Uh, so this is for Fonseca, it's part of their school redesign grant. I understand about the redesign grant, but doesn't DESE provide monitoring? This, so this is an outside agency that contracts with the State Department, and that is the cost of the monitoring site visit that happens annually at each of those schools. Are you telling me that the American Institute for Research is contracted with the state? Yes and we pay for it out of our grant. Because the money- the And we federal, can't use that money for anything else other than the American Institute of Research. Correct, Mr. Martin. This is a federal grant. The requirement is that the accountability is through a monitoring site visit. Well, I can understand the accountability. I don't have any problem with that. Just that I uh, have an outside agency that is contracting for $24,000. They have a lot of state contracts, sir, that they do all of the site visits, level Say four again, site sorry, visits. Sir. They have a, a, a very large contract on a state bid list that they do all of the level four site visits in the Commonwealth, uh, and that those site visits are then uh, uh, managed, i.e. monitored by the department. So this is all part of the state accountability system written in statute in the I believe it was the Ed Reform Act of 93, but it might have been upgraded in the 2012 Act. I can get you that, that language if you'd like. I'll take your word for it that uh, uh, this is a, a state approved through their bidding process uh, in there to provide for, I, I, but I was under the understanding that uh, DESE would come down to do monitoring site visits periodically through the throughout the year yeah they do the um, they do a different type of monitoring site visit they do assistance and the, those are uh, much briefer these are very intense with uh, great reporting and that they all go directly to the commissioner and then the commissioner uses these reports to, de to decide which schools stay in level four status or, or which two schools are removed and what year are we in for this uh, um, so monitoring? Fonseca is in year two. Year two. 
So we've already gone through year one. We're in year two. Yes. We got one more year to go. Yes. And we are where we are with Fonseca. However, uh, I'm just looking for where money can be utilized to be able to provide additional classroom assistance. All of this professional development, all of this extended time, uh, all of this uh, grant monies uh, in there, uh, they're all great. They all have a purpose, I agree. But the only thing is, we still are where we are. And uh, the students, unfortunately, uh, need additional help, and I don't think they're getting it. But I'll go along with that. I, I yield on number two. Okay, further discussion on item number two? Motion to approve. Motion to approve is made. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yep. Mr. Martin? Reluctantly, yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Item number three was also uh, with, uh, withheld. Item uh, number research. three is the research for better teaching. Uh, that's for a course. It looks like this course is already going on, but now the committee is being asked to approve it. I don't understand that. So we came to the committee, I believe, and informed the committee that we were going to train the administrators in. Um, at a vow, which hadn't been done in several years here in Fall River. Am I correct about that, Kevin? So the way that the contracts work is it's taken this long to get a contract before the committee for approval. The course has had a couple sessions so far. This was, uh, you know, it, from August 21, 18 through August 23, 18. And then for the half days, and back to August. That was during, yet, the, during the Admin Institute. I'm not, I'm not uh, concerned about the, uh, the professional development. It looks like this is on uh, release time, uh, and therefore, or during the course of the person's day. Is that correct? It's, yes, it's during the release time. Okay. Work, yes. Uh, that that I, ha I don't have a problem with, but I do have a, a big problem with uh, professional development that's on an overtime basis. But that's not what we're talking about here, Mr. Martins. So I th understand that. This is during the day. We scheduled it so that it was in concurrent with the Summer Leadership Institute and then the half days, and then I think there's also one or two full days, uh, but during our day, not there's yeah, no I overtime. They're already being paid, and that's fine. Yes, I don't have a problem with that. Okay, I you. I'm three. Mr. Agar, just to follow up on that question, what would the um, Mr. Martins raises a good point that we're getting it after the fact, but can somebody explain why we wouldn't just pay this in August before the event starts? So if, yeah. we, if we knew this was going to happen in August, the budget starts July 1, why would we not just get something ahead of time to say, here's the bill for, you know, or was that in and it, this is just the payment? I'm just looking for somebody, maybe Mr. Almeida can ask, uh, can answer that, but it just seems like when they, something's presented that the date already happened, it does cause a little. Yeah, I understand uh, that. Answer. No, it's, it's something I was aware of and I just intentionally, I, it was by, by accident, I didn't place it on the agenda ahead, ahead of time. But you knew you, what the bill was ahead of time, so I it's did. not like you're spending I money did. that they could have jacked it up or anything. It was no, a set. I, it was a set amount, and I, and I knew that was coming forward to you. I just finally got it on the agenda. It's my fault. No problem. And uh, 25 participants, is that only, I know we have a lot more administrators than that to do eval, so is that a portion of them? Are we gonna... That's all we can do in the first course. So they limit it to 25? They, they limit it. And... Um, some people have already been trained in the past. Some have been trained, but I'm assuming we'll probably do another session this coming year. Because it's, it's like every, I don't know, every few years, you get, because of the change in administrators to go through this course, I don't know if you've been through RBT before, but I've been through it probably three or four times. It's from a VP to a principal and all yeah. that. My only concern with the 25, and 
maybe this is not the time to ask it, but are we going to use that RBT style across the board? No questions asked. Because what was happening when I worked here was we were getting trained as, you know, in-house, but we were all trying to get, so it was very similar. But if we got 25 people getting it, the other people might have had it, and then you have this evaluator, you get a certain type, you get another. So has the district adopted this is the style of? Well, I mean, cl claim evidence, interpretation, judgment, I mean, to me, is the only way to do it. So I'm hopeful that we get to a place that we have great consistency in all the evaluations using the RBT model. I taught a course on informal feedback uh, a month ago, uh, and I used the RBT uh, methodology to do that, and I had about 35 VPs in that class. And so I'm assuming I'll do the same thing when I have them again in February. Yeah, I'm not passing judgment on whether it's, I think it's fine to do, but for consistency purposes, I think you as the boss coming down and saying, this is what our expectation is, it makes it clearer for those that are doing it. Yeah. That's my only point. With that, I yield. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. I got, I, got two, I got two quick questions. Are they getting any graduate credit for this or just PDPs? Because I, I looked at the cost per participant, yeah. and I'm saying we got to partner up with someone to get them three so, graduate So they're partnering with Fitchburg State. I think each participant has to pay an additional $300 to get the, the three, three, three credit cohorts. Okay. We are giving PDPs. Okay. So if they pay the $300, they will get both. But that's on them, right. Okay. Thanks. Yield. Okay. Is there a motion to approve this contract? So, so moved. Move. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Mr. Aguil? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. We have a number of grants for approval this evening. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Question. Question. Mr. Aguil? Just uh, maybe it's not the time to ask this either, but we're getting a grant for 13000 I read that purpose of it is which is fine what is the status of the overall McKinney Vento in the state are they funding us properly are they not funding it fully what's the status of that we, last year we were 65 percent we fought the governor went up to I think 75 percent fully funding McKinney Vento at the end of the year are we, are we talking about tra the transportation money or anything specifically so in regards to this McKinney McKinney Vento grant Historically, we've received $40,000 per year. And so as you can see from this grant for this year, we're getting $13,000. So I wouldn't say we're, you know, we're fully funded. Um, but in general, when, with, in regards to transportation, last year the reimbursement was, I want to say about 30 to 33% or so of the total expended is what it was. So to say it's fully funded, it's not fully funded. Yeah, if I may just ask to get a report on that, uh, just a quick little report, what the percentage is. I've, I've said it before, that's a, a mandate from the state. They said it should be 100% funded, and we should hold them accountable to 100%. With that also, if you could get us some sort of detail on cost sharing and what that looks like in the district uh, for transportation. And with that, I yield. Thank you. So I can easily put that in the Friday memo, but I'll also include the memo that we sent to the legislators last year on this issue, just to refresh everyone's memory, because we'll probably have to write the same one this year. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mr. Aguia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Okay, we have a number of items for discussion this evening. Number one is the city health insurance uh, plan that's presented by Mr. Kevin Almeida. And, uh, Chief Financial Officer for the City of Fall River, Mary Zahdi. <coughs> so, I, uh, just to brief the committee and the public watching, so this was placed on the agenda for the discussion of the health insurance uh, policy. The city took that back um, a couple years ago, uh, back on our side, and uh, we'll just give an update and you can give your perspective and then committee members can ask their questions and then we'll just go from there. Sure. So Kevin, if you want to give an overview of why that happened a couple years back. Sure. Great. Um, so going back about five years, um, health insurance was you know, kind of a little hot potato and we didn't, and the totals were going up and down from a year to year basis. And you know, um, we had a few years where the, when the health insurance was on the city side that um, 
we severely underexpended the amount that was budgeted um, on the health insurance side. And so in 2000, fiscal year 2016, health insurance was negotiated into the school department side. Um, when that happened, um, for whatever reason, we had this grandiose year that health insurance skyrocketed for that year. Not sure, not, I don't have a specific reason as to why, but that's what happened. And so we've seen, you know, over the years, some significant fl fluctuations uh, in health insurance. Uh, in, F in FY17, insurance went back to the city. And so, um, as we stand here tonight, um, what's, been provided, what's been provided to you in the documents is an update on health insurance you know, for the school department and where we stand. Um, the three documents in front of you is an um, update as to what's been expended to date, what the projection is um, made by the city side, and what the projection made, was made by myself, provided to you in the documents. In addition, provided is uh, a last several years of history on total health spending and how much the school department and what the percentage is in relation to the total for the school side. Uh, you'll see that it's about 55 and a half percent. And finally, um, the final page is um, a document from GBS showing what the funding um, should be um, made for for the city for total health care. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Mayor, do you want to give an overview as well? Sure, Mayor. Um, so health insurance is really paid for on a claims basis. So what happens on an annual basis when we're putting together the budget at the beginning of the year, we're looking at what the claims were that were paid in the previous years. So as Kevin just indicated, approximately 55% of the claims paid were school department claims. And he's correct, back in the 2016 timeframe, the school department took health insurance back into their computation. The health insurance would have been basically the same computation, but what it did was it eliminated some of the uncertainty with net school spending. So there's a lot of discussion at the beginning of the year as to whether we're at 100% of net school spending or 101% of net school spending. And that's all based on the <clears throat> calculation of what the estimated health care expense is going to be. So in the past four years, and that's in your document, health insurance has gone from 37 million as high as 42 million back down to 41 million. This past year, GBS, their, um, our advisors for health insurance, has estimated health insurance to come in at approximately $39 million. 55% of that is $21 million, which has been allocated to the school department as part of the net school spending analysis. The reason that it's dropped in 2019's budget is because the city had an initiative to carve out the prescription drugs. So the prescri prescription drugs were carved out in 2019. So you now see an additional line item within the allocation of the budget for Maxor, and that's the prescription dr drug. So the healthcare did not truly drop from 41 million down to 39 million. Healthcare expense, as with all of your healthcare costs, are always increasing. And they did increase again this year but it doesn't appear that way in the analysis from GBS because the prescription drugs were carved out. So you'll see that in a separate line item in the document that Kevin provi provided to you. Um, <clears throat> we are only into the year at about four months, um, give or take some of the expenditures depending on exactly what time of the month that they're actually paid for. So what you're looking at realistically in both documents, the one Kevin provided to you and he prepared and the one that was pre prepared by the city is really too premature at this particular point to really project what the health care costs are going to be by the end of the fiscal year. Um, we have in previous fiscal years been over the projections prepared by GBS and in other fiscal years been under the projection. Um, so realistically when we come to theoretically September of next year, September of 2019, when the <clears throat> um, end of the year report is prepared and we really know what the health costs are, we'll really be able to tell you then as to where we're at with net school spending. Remembering that there's a two-month lag when you receive your bills from Blue Cross. 
So the bill that's being paid in the month of July each year is the bill for claims paid in May, and the June bill is paid in August. In addition, there's something that's referred to as runoff claims, and those are the claims that haven't been processed by the docs or the hospitals, and they're runoff because they're still being claims paid in the months of September and October and November of each calendar year that relate back to the prior fiscal year. Um, so I hope that helps you understand a little bit better as to the estimate and how it's prepared. Um, but we're certainly here to answer any questions that each of you may have. I think the big question is gonna be, at the end of the day, there might be some other questions in between, but do you wanna take the health insurance back to the, the uh, school department side? Kevin, I don't know if you wanna elaborate on that answer, but I think that's gonna be the, one of the cruxes of the questions. <laughs> And just, I'll let Kevin answer that, but just so that I can, from the, from the city side, since I'm here representing the city, um, it would certainly help if it were in the school department's budget, because that's one item that's $23 million that wouldn't be an item that we would be discussing on an annual basis as to whether we're up over the 101% of net school spending or that we're under, because we don't know until the end of the next fiscal year um, what the net school spending amount is, so it would help stabilize that whole conversation. And to answer your question, Mayor, um, I would say no, just because of my history with the account when we had it in our budget. Okay, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both. I guess because of the way it's designed and, and the health insurance being on the city side, I guess my only concern is that the last report we received is if we spend down the entire budgeted amount for health care, that as it stands right now, we're about $58,000 above 100% of net school spending. I guess the, the concern that I have is that if the projections, we don't meet those projections as stated and as budgeted, we come in far below that, the city's gonna drop below its, its required net school spending number for that fiscal year. And, and so I know the committee at the last meeting asked Mr. Almeida to continue to watch as the claims come in, as they're processed so that we can, you know, know sooner rather than later how close we're going to become, how close we're going to come, excuse me, to what's required for net school spending and what that insurance line will look like. So um, I, I've, I've seen it both ways. I've seen the city have the health insurance. I've seen us take on the health insurance. I understand some of the things that have been done in the past with health insurance and how that's been budgeted in order to, you know, meet a, a net school spending number. I will say this, that I think this administration has done a better job at using accurate projections with their increases. Um, I think in years past, we were estimating 4% and the city was saying it was 16% or something of the double digits. And so at that point, it raised concerns for me and others that we can't be that far off and what we're projecting will be our increases for the following year. So I think we've gotten better or closer to what uh, the guidance is from the GBS in terms of what we should be budgeting. My only concern with health insurance is that um, it's a line item that has to be watched very closely because it has implications for net school spending. Um, and and it, if we don't meet that number through health insurance, then we have to figure out another way to do it. And, and what is that? Is that a simple transfer through the mayor's office to the council and then back to the school department? And as you've stated, with the two months lag and then the runoff, sometimes we're not seeing those funds until you know halfway through the following year and that proposes budgetary problems for this committee as we're asked to create a budget sooner now than we ever have been able per the charter so i just ask that the two of you continue you know to to talk about the claims that what numbers are, are, we're see, are we seeing in terms of um, payments and if we do know sooner rather than later that there's no way we're going to meet our projected health insurance so we have those conversations so that we can account for that in our, bu our budget preparations for fiscal 2020. Um, outside of that, I, I, I thank you. I, you know, I think it is helpful that we have comparison um, for the committee to review. I appreciate you providing. I think this is maybe one of the first times I've seen the GPS, you know, uh, recommendations to the city. I know we've heard what they've suggested, but it's nice to see it um, with my own eyes and, and so, I would just ask that that you know, collaboration continue because it is an important line item for our budget. It does have big implications when it comes to our end of the year report and how that gets uh, credited, what number we get credited by the DESC in terms of whether or not we met our obligation by law. So 
with that, thank you, and, and Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you. Mr. Aguilar. Yeah, just a couple of questions. So related to the budget, you talked about how the health care is budgeted at the start of the year. Can you articulate where that number comes from? Um, so the city uses a company called GBS, and that company prepares the estimate for the Blue Cross, so for the health care expense. So it does not include the stop loss insurance. It does not include the payments to Maxor, although we're working with them for those types of estimates as well. We have another consultant on board for, um, in particular, the prescription drugs. <clears throat> We then sit down with um, GBS and basically challenge their increases because you, you have to remember that they want to be as conservative as possible and have the increase so that they're not, we're not coming back to them at the end of the year saying you projected 39 million and wait a minute, we've got a $41 million expense, how are we going to cover that increase as well? So we do go back and forth with GBS in various meetings in the early winter with regard to the calculation of their projected increase and challenge the, their increase in order to be as fair as possible, both um, from their end and from our end, because again, not only do you have a concern with net school spending, we also have a concern with the budgetary amount that we've included in, in as an appropriation in the general fund budget. Because if we don't meet that budget, we need to go back to city council and potentially request a transfer out of free cash to cover the difference. So we want to be, we don't want to be overly conservative because we don't want to put monies aside that we're not going to need for health care, but we don't want to be under the estimate either um, for exactly the opposite reason. So when that gets, do you look into how many employees are on the health care or is it strictly on the large number? Uh, no, it's based on the participants, and it's broken down between the retirees and the um, active employees. So when you say that the money goes into an account on the city side, is that um, documented anywhere? Yes, based on Mass General Law, it goes into a health care trust fund, and that's where the um, payments to Blue Cross and your other vendors are paid out of. Okay. So if I look at last year's uh, end of the year report that came out and the budgeted amount for insurance was 24,309,000. The actual was 22,955 for a difference of 1.3 million. So where is that money from last year as far as in the city coffers? If it was in the trust fund as you just indicated, so, where so, is it now? So there are a lot of things that come, come into play, but the, the monies that are appropriated in the general fund go directly into the um, employer trust fund as well as the employee trust fund. So the appropriation goes into the employer trust fund. All of the expenses are paid out of the employer trust fund to include any of the runoff claims or any other expenses that the city may have with regard to health care. So stop loss insurance, for an example, um, all gets calculated into those amounts. In addition, we need to wait so there's a lag time for the stop loss insurance that comes back to us. So those claims that are over the insured amount will come back to us as an offset against the stop loss, which then is allocated by employee to the appropriate department, if you will. <clears throat> those monies are included in um, an employer trust fund. So it's not as simple as saying there's a $2 million spread between the budget and the actual to say that this trust fund has an additional $2 million in. We would be certainly happy to share with you the activities in the trust fund because we track that as well. Um, <clears throat> but that um, trust fund is where the employer share, so the city share, including the school department and all other departments, um, would be where the dollars are sitting before the actual invoice is paid. So, but the, it was very clear after, and this was only in November, so it was after months, it wasn't right on July 1. It indicated that there was a difference of 1.3 million that was, you know, for budgeted that the actuals came in after all said and done in November, that there was still a $1.3 million difference in last year's budget. Uh, well, I don't, ha I don't have that with me um, this evening, Mr. Aguio, but I would be happy to get that for you and to get the analysis of the trust fund. Okay, because it would logically <clears throat> indicate that there was $1.3 million in that fund allocated for the schools to be at 101% prior year, 
of net school spending, which lowered it down to just barely making the 100 percent. So uh, any information that you could get on that to the committee would be Certainly. at least great so we could see where that, I don't know the city side and I don't know where it sits and what item or what report you can get, but at that point you, I would wonder what was that 1.3 million if it was committed to the school. So the mayor and in his infinite wisdom with the council said we were gonna fund the schools last year at 101, including this amount of money for healthcare. In my mind, if that came through at 1.3 million off to the good, I think we should have got some of that for the school department needs. Well, no, that's, it's, allocated by the, it's allocated by the city council for health care expense, so it can't just come back to the school department as an operating expense. It would have to then go back to um, being closed out to this trust fund, and then the city council, technically, if this trust fund was holding a million dollars in it, and they wanted to take that million dollars and use it for something other than health insurance, then they could potentially reduce the current year's health insurance by some amount. It would never be my um, recommendation that that trust fund be eliminated or be brought down to zero because you're gonna have years, and we've had them here in the city just recently, where the health care expense has been significantly more than what was budgeted. So we have to be really careful. That trust fund, I've only been here for three years now, and that trust fund has been down to almost zero. It might have even been negative at one point, and right now we have a balance in that trust fund. So it's, it's, it's a fluent account, and you'd, be very you'd want to be very cautious, and DOR would not be admit admittable to us <clears throat> depleting all of those monies in it. So it's not really money that is assigned to the school department. Well, I <clears throat> respectfully disagree in that when it's <clears throat> in the effort of transparency is committed to say, we're gonna spend X amount of dollars on healthcare, and that amount was lower by 1.3 million, I think it's a little disingenuous to say that it wasn't allocated for the schools. But with that being said, that would therefore mean that there's a cushion in last year's number for 1.3 million, the way that I've just, you've heard what you've explained. So we had a cushion in that trust fund in the city to the tune of 1.3 million last year. And I think that's relevant to the conversation we're having today because the report that came in today indicated from your numbers on the city side, 1.384 is projected to be left again. Mr. Almeida comes in with a number of 1.78 million is gonna be left over. That's why it's my recommendation that the health insurance being $21 million be included in the school department's budget and not be included in the city's budget at all and then there wouldn't be any issues. If you had a million dollar savings, you could reallocate those million dollars among yourselves to um, the classroom. And if you had a million dollar shortfall, you could then make the appropriate cuts that are necessary. I would much prefer the right. entire the, amount to be on the school department side. But the only problem with that is, is that you can't have your cake and eat it too. And the bottom line is, is you're telling us you want us to take the bad part but you're not gonna let us take the good part, such as surpluses in revenue, increases in revenue. So don't think that you can come here to say, well, why don't you guys take it like it's, like it's a joke? We, we do take the bad part because we had to cover the cost when the health insurance expense was higher than the projection. And that would be true again this year. If the health insurance expense comes in higher than the projection, the net, um, um, yeah, success, it's gonna be higher. Your cost is gonna be higher. So when we get to the end of the year report, it's going to look like we've overfunded the school department yeah, by really more than 1%. Do you really think that's going to happen this year? You I, just gave us a report that said we're $1.3 million to the we're good. Only, we're only three months or four months into the year. I don't know what the, the spring's going to bring. I, I highly doubt it. Well, if you um, ask Mr. Almeida, he'll tell you that when he looked at the first month, July, he was very concerned that you were going to be way over. Right. So my other lines of questioning is, when we started the budget, we had a certain number of employees. And I asked the question of the school administration to say, how many employees do we have now? Because I was also concerned on the city side to say, if we're adding new positions, which we did, that I didn't want to add them willy-nilly without knowing whether the city had the funds in their number for health care. Have you had that kind of discussion with the school department as far as how many people were in the original budget and how many they have now? Um, no, well, again, we, we utilize 
a point in time when we're preparing the budget. So we don't go back in a given month and compare we're claims-based, so we don't go back in a given month. We're not premiums, so we're not paying a premium for a certain number of employees this month and next month paying a different premium because we have more employees or less employees. We're paying based on claims-based um, <clears throat> projections. And so we look at the health care sometime in the month of January and February, and we work with GBS at that time frame with that number of participants in the program to com compute the um, estimate of the health insurance cost for the next fiscal year. All right, so when that happens and it's just strictly by claims, there's gotta be a, a way that you charge a certain individual their percentage, 75, 25. There has to be a number that's assigned to each person. Family plan, 20 grand, exactly. something like that. So, so, so what happens is GBS, when they do the analysis, they come up with the cost, so the, the 21 million, they add to it whatever other costs, so the prescription drugs, they add to it the stop loss insurance, they add to it um, some of the other immaterial costs, but certainly costs to the program, and they come up with a rate. And then that rate is calculated based on a single plan and a family plan. And that's the rate that is given to the employees for their 25% share or their withholding um, on the every two week time frame. So there for would the be payroll. enough projected to cover the expenses and claims later on. That's correct. So if, you, if I understand that and you say that in January, February, whenever GBS did this, I think it's incumbent upon the city, the school department, and GBS to come back and figure out how many participants do we currently have in February, March, and how many do we have now? Because it's a lot less on healthcare now than it was in February, March, which therefore leads to these numbers making sense to me. I don't know how you can say there are a lot less. I don't believe there are a lot less employees in the city of Fall River. Uh, uh, Mr. Almeida, could you come to the podium, please? So how many employees do we have on healthcare now so, relative to so when you can very much so when you compare the active employees that we've had in our system just for, just for active employees this year compared to last year we're about 60 to 70 short of last year on health care yes can you say that again yes 60 to 70 short on our act so as in far february as active or employees. march which was last year we might have had let's say for round numbers a thousand employees that were taking health care and what you're telling me now is that we currently have 60 less than that. Just on, on the act, just, just on the active side. I don't know what's happened on the right. retiree side. But we have 60 so. less, and we have actually yes. more employees. Yes. So that's the reason why I think that we have to have these discussions now, because it's the numbers when you look at 60 employees, and you look at $20,000 for a, a health care, which costs a lot of money, these numbers aren't that far off when you're looking at 1.2 or 1.7. So there's definitely issues going on relative to how we, I think we need to update our GBS. I don't know what they get paid, but if they're getting paid to give us false numbers, they maybe shouldn't get paid. But ultimately, I think we need to watch it closer. And the fact that we're, as Mr. Costa mentioned, we're only over by short 50,000 or 60,000 in net school spending. We're gonna be coming back at the end of the year saying you were short 1.3 million. And I know that's not Mayor Carrez, desire to short us 1.3 million. I don't think it's the cities or the council or anybody. All I'm saying is that we're faced with an issue right now that the reality is we're gonna be way under net school spending in the current year. And we have needs that need to happen and need to get funded as soon as possible. It may not be tonight, I'm not suggesting that we do that tonight. But it's definitely an issue that should be looked at in what, what are we gonna do with that money? How can we spend that money? How can we, we really don't have a savings account, for instance, in the school department. We can't say, yeah, give us half a million, we'll put it in the savings account for the year and go as emergency. We don't really have that ability. But ultimately speaking, I don't want to come into next year's budget saying you, it's 1.3 million, and then what? It, it, it's just kicking it down the road. So I think it's pretty clear that we have less employees on health care, and I think it's actually to a, a decision that the city made or the council or the school committee, whoever, to try and move people off of uh, their spouse's health care or something like that. So it was actually a good initiative to save this kind of money. If that's the case, let's work on some kind of plan with the superintendent and the city administration to come up with a plan for how we're gonna spend some of this money because I, I think it's very clear that we're not gonna meet it. So with that said, I would ask for your uh, you know, 
support at least on looking at this, and I'd like to ask that um, we can get a report to the full committee called a loss ratio report from GBS on a monthly basis going forward. Thank you. Thank I yield. You. Thank you. Mr. Martins. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Mr. Ciotti. Uh, I understand the insurance claims basis uh, here. Um, questions that I have is that, uh, and uh, Mr. Agia may have alluded to this, but I was I'm not certain. Uh, the sheet that I'm looking at says transfer from other funds. What other funds? For 1.3 million. So those, that's what our grants pay on a yearly basis, Mr. Marnes? I'm sorry? That, that is what our grants pay on a yearly basis. That's what you, yeah. I, I apologize. <clears throat> That's what our grants pay on a yearly basis. So our employees that are assigned what, to our what grants are you talking about? Title one, title uh, title two, SPED. Those are our three biggest grants. Okay, so that uh, that one point three million is that an addition or is that a subtraction from? That's sub that that is a subtra subtraction from the total, Mr. Martins. So they're paying a portion. Of the total. Okay, so Mr. Martin, I guess it's, I'm trying. It's like a source of revenue. I'm sorry. It's like a source of revenue. So it's a cash receipt into the health care claims account. When I add everything up, it comes out to twenty-five million five hundred eighty-three thousand one hundred and seven dollars. Then you have to subtract out the one point three million. Then that brings it to this figure. Twenty-four million two eighty-three uh, in there, but um, what is the actual budget for health care? It's the twenty-four million two eighty-three. It's the first column on the spreadsheet. So the actual budget is twenty-four point two, well, almost point three million. Correct. All right, but. What does this, if you're, you're indicating that that's like a, a cash that you, you mentioned for that 1.3 million? The, oh. the 1.3 million is the amount of money that is paid for by your grants, your SPED grant, your Title I grant, your Title II grant. In those grants, you have a line item called benefits, yep. and the benefits yep. are the health insurance, and so the money is transferred from the grant accounting to the operating fund to cover the cost of health care for those teachers who are charged directly to those grants. Okay, is that included in net school spending? It is not included in net school spending, which is why we're subtracting it here as okay, part so of. So it is not included. The money from the grants is not included as net school okay. spending. Now I'm getting to understand. I, in the, on the last uh, are the two columns on the right hand side of the page projected by the city, projected by the, by the school. Um, those figures do not coincide with each other or match each other. Do you have, both of you have uh, opportunities to discuss all of these lines? as to you know, what is your projection, what is your projection, so that they are basically understood and that it's... We, we, we certainly can, and, and certainly Mr. Almeida and myself um, talk on a regular basis with regard to estimates, but this was just to give you an idea of what kind of range there could be based on utilizing estimates, just simply in some of these cases, it's simply taking four months, dividing it by four and multiplying it by 12 because we don't know what the estimates are going to be. I know, because you're based on claims. So it gives you an idea that there are multiple ways to get there and we're only four months but, into the fiscal year. You know, when you mention about the, um, uh, the group benefit strategies, uh, and I guess they come up with a percentage of what the cost might increase by? They do. Right. From what I understand, there doesn't seem to be 
much dialogue between the school department and the city with regards to what it is, uh, that percentage. Okay. Um, the material that you receive is that same material sent to the school department? No, it's not. The material from GBS is, is generally maintained in the HR department within the city. Um, certainly we could, um, I don't go to all the meetings necessarily because they're generally meetings with HR, but certainly Mr. Almeida would be more than welcome to come to the meetings. I believe you do have some members of the school department. I think Becky goes on a regular basis, so she has, um, those reports that I'm talking about, or well, has yeah. access to them. Yeah, um, I think one of the things in what, last year or the year before, uh, you know, four percent when there was a difference, a large difference between the two, and uh, you know, it seems to me that there wasn't any discussion going on. Whatever you sent to the school department is what the school department used, and um, that was what I brought up last month with regards to, uh, is there a dialogue between Mr. Almeida's office and your office with regards to what the actual cost or percentage, I know it can, it's subjected to, to the uh, you know, claims basis uh, in there, but when you're establishing a budget for health care uh, and you know, the increase of cost uh, uh, needs to be mutually understood and agreed that yes, this is true and it can't have two different numbers because the school department then starts the budget for uh, you know, health care and it's, well, you know, if you're gonna do it your way, then you take over the whole thing. I don't have any problem with the uh, with what you in, uh, indicated in your, where you started the conversation uh, of having the health care uh, as a total school department issue. Because uh, you know, they're employees of the school department, fine. And they are part of net school spending, fine. I don't have any problem with that uh, in there. My problem is that is it accurately being calculated? That's my problem. Well, healthcare is an, an estimate, and the estimate is provided by GBS, who's the expert in the field of healthcare. And they do a number of municipalities, and they are looking at what the total cost of healthcare increases are, working with both Blue Cross and other vendors. They don't work with just Blue Cross. The share that the school department receives from the city is based on actual claims for previous years. So that was another one of the worksheets that we provided to you in the packet showing you that from the year <clears throat> 2016 um, through 2018, the school department's share of the Blue Cross expenses, and, and just the Blue Cross expenses I might want to remind you of, was approximately 55%. So that's where the percentage comes in. So once we determine with GBS that we are in agreement that it appears that their estimates are reasonable, and as I said earlier, we do challenge them and have them go back and relook at some of those estimates. Once we determine that the estimated health care cost is going to be a particular number, in this case $39 million, we simply apply the 55% to it to apply that to the school department share. I don't know how it look. I guess that 55% is based on actual total claims. insurance and the number of employees that's on the city. It's, Oops, it's actually based on claims, not number of employees. So I'm you could sorry. have one employee with a million dollar claim, or you could have, you know, 500 employees with a total of a million dollar claim. Okay, I, I certainly understand that, look, you can have a catastrophic illness and cost a whole bunch of money. I understand that. But, uh, you know, when you, where did the 55% come from in it, that case? It, it came from historical data. So I used four years of historical data of actual claims by the school department to the total claims paid to Blue Cross. And that is the total is the city's employees 
and the, it's the school department employees. It's the correct. Right. But it's not based on the number of employees. It's based on the claims paid okay. for the claims paid for the employees, the city employees, adding to the claims paid by the school department employees. That's correct. Okay. So that worksheet is included in your packet, and you can see for the last number of years, four years, the total paid by the school for the school department and the total paid for the city employees to equal the grand total, ranging anywhere from $37 million to $42 million in fiscal 17, dropping back down to $41 million in fiscal 18, which goes to Mr. Aguia's point that the claims actually dropped in 18 over 17. Well, but, <clears throat> okay, that 55% was based on historical data. Correct. Correct. Okay. Something that could happen and it would be more next year. Something could happen and it won't be as much next year. Okay. So that 55% is fluid. Correct. All right. Uh, in there. My concern is that is there a discussion between the school department and the city coming to agreement that yes, this is accurate for the claims of the city, this is accurate for the claims of the, of the uh, uh, school department. The and superintendent would like to weigh in, Mr. Martins. I'm sorry? The superintendent would like to weigh in. Fine. So Can I return? Yes, okay. still have the floor. In terms of discussion with the administration, um, this is an ongoing negotiation that we have during the budget season. We have lengthy discussions about total costs and it usually starts a lot higher than what we end up at. So they give us a cost, we fight, we fight, we go back, we look at figures, we have our PERAC committees looking at all sorts of things and we come back at a figure that is much more reasonable uh, by the time we develop our final budget. So in terms of the discussion between the city and the administration is two or three ongoing discussions. The first is Kevin and, and his team with uh, Mary and her team. The second is with me and Mary uh, and uh, uh, Ms. Viveris directly and then both with me and the mayor and, and them directly. So we have lots of discussion through the process because we want to get the number right and we want to get it down as low as possible because that's going to mean more money in the general operating fund for, for, uh, for learning and teaching. But I think what's also been made very clear here tonight is that this is not a perfect science. And it's, it's uh, every year, it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, for, forecasting is not as accurate as we would like it to be when it comes to health insurance, and that's the reality. Mr. Martin, you still have the floor. The, may I continue? Yes, you may. <clears throat> I agree to the discussion, but we had a problem last year, I guess it was, right, uh, about the actual understanding of what it is that is charged to the school department. Ultimately, what for school employees, whether it's paid from the, uh, the city or it's paid for out of the uh, school department budget, add those two together and that still goes to med school spending. Is that not so? The amount paid or the amount of the claims for the school department is the amount included in net school spending. Absolutely so. Not the amount that the city pays for the city employees. But it's coming, you, you write out the checks, correct? Correct. Okay. And all of that is net school spending? No, only the portion that relates to the school department employees of course. is included in the net school spending. Of course, you're not gonna take the DPW person and put it on to our net school spending. Understood. Uh, okay. Uh, as long as there's discussion and you both come up with the, uh, an accurate figure of what it is that uh, is the cost for school department employees for health care. That's all that I'm asking for. Thank you. How are you? Thank you. Mr. Corey. 
Thank you, Mr. Sahadi, uh, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Mr. Almeida. I'll be the first to tell both of you that if I were running the numbers, we'd be in the hole tomorrow. Believe me, I couldn't keep the ship afloat. You guys are always dealing with moving targets. I get that. Um, what I hear, what I listen to in this discussion, uh, I hear the term net school spending, and that's all I want to advocate on, in that when all is said and done after the new numbers are formulated this spring as we prepare for budget season, I just want to make sure that the school department is, is getting net school spending. That's what, I'm, that's what I want to advocate for because we need every penny we, we can grab right now for the services for our students. That's where I'm coming from. With that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Exler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so along the same lines, I'm just I'm curious to know what the mechanism is for recouping some of the health insurance money savings. I mean, the goal here is just to put that money back to the school system so we can reach 100% net school spending. So what's the mechanism? I hear we're going to save the money and we want to hold on to it and we don't really know until September, or November even. So how do we make sure that money gets spent in the fiscal year for the school budget in order to meet net school spending? What can we do? You put the health care back in your budget is really how you do it. That's the only okay. way you do it. If you leave the health care the way it is, the talk. mechanism, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be fresh, but if you leave the, the health care the way it is, the additional monies, the monies that are not spent, are now sitting out in a health care claims trust fund. How it relates back to the next year's budget is when, let's say, GBS comes back with $39 million again next year but we're sitting with $2 million, we'll say, round numbers, in the health care trust fund. We may say, as, a, as the administration, you know what, we'll take half of that and we'll slice the $39 million and we will make it $38 million, and then we will <clears throat> allocate the expense between the, health, between the school department and the city. But the employees, um, certainly there are certain retirees that are very vocal about the fact that the health claims trust fund is still not sufficient enough to cover any expenses that may occur in a given year that were unanticipated. And so there's a, there's a, a, a point in time where you've really got to look at the trust fund itself, or we have to look at the trust fund itself, and we have to say, okay, do we have excess money in that trust fund, and we can allocate it back to both the school department and the city, because it's really the appropriation that comes from the city's budget, or is there um, not sufficient money in that trust fund if there has, has to be any um, catastrophic expenses in a given year, and, and I'll go back to July only because it was one month and it stood on its own. But this particular year, in July, you had a situation where you had um, school expenses that were significantly over what we had anticipated um, July's expenses to be for health care, and that's because you had claims that were unexpected, um, and we can't speak about because of the HIPAA and, and everything else, but you had claims that were significantly higher than you would have expected for July, to the point that Mr. Almeida called me and said, whoa, wait a minute, What's going on with health care? Right. I thought we were going to have a savings with, with Maxor. So I understand that the numbers are going to go so, up and down, and they fluctuate with claims and based on illnesses. Um, so, if, if, so, so let's say the money came back over to the school side, and, well, now we need more money. And I know you referenced, well, then we'd have to cut services. Well, right. at that point, couldn't we ask the city to step in, maybe with some stabilization money to fill those gaps? You could ask. Well, th so, <laughs> that's, so let me just weigh in on that point, because I know we're going to go back and forth for a little bit longer. But that's exactly the point. So prior, right now, yeah, great. We have $8 million in stabilization due to many, many different people that made that possible through this administration, school department, the fire department, police department, everybody trying to be as fiscally responsible as possible. But turn the, back, the clocks back three years ago, you don't have any stabilization. Where do you go? The city doesn't, there's no other money. There's no magical pot of money where we can get that money from. So it's a, it's, it's not, it's not good, and there are some members, like the chairman, who were here during some of those years where it was tough, and I know he wants to weigh in, so I'm going to just briefly go to him, give you back the floor if that's okay, Mr. Hexler. I still have a few questions yes. or comments. So you'll still, have the, you'll still have the floor, but it, Ms. Mr. Costa is going to weigh in on this. I'll wait until Mr. Hexler is Okay, no if problem. You don't mind so you still have the floor, Mr. Hexler. a couple of comments that I'll make regarding the shift to the city and school, and, right. and then I'll yield. 
Yep. So, Mr. Hexler, so, you still have the floor. I think it, it maybe it's beneficial to us in one sense to keep the money, the health insurance money on the city side, so that way if we needed funds, right, mm -hmm. it wouldn't come out of our budget right mm -hmm. away. That's it correct. would have to come out of the city side. So I can see why we'd want, like to keep that there. But again, if we're not meeting net school spending and the city has committed to that, yeah. so at that point, I mean, what? I believe we can only fall a certain percentage under that number before we get fined or before whatever happens, right? So we just would like to put some of that money to use. We understand the city has needs and our concern is that the schools have needs and that's what we're here to advocate for. So going forward, I'm not sure the best course of action is, but we definitely, we'd like to see some of that money, the cost savings. And I'm not sure if it's directly from, you know, historically has the savings been more on the school side or more on the, the, the city employee side. You know, I'm not sure if that data helps us or not. Maybe the savings always ends up being on the school side. I don't know. Or maybe it's 50-50. I, 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 don't, I don't know either. Um, I can certainly go back. We have a lot of years of history that we've saved on the server since we've moved over to Munis. So I may be able to do an analysis to see really where the savings were based on the budget at for any one of those given years. Right, I mean, I don't, probably I don't know right now the some people, knowing that, you know, if the school system has been the cause of the savings right. historically. Well, we know the one year, 2016, it, it. it was significantly over, Okay. which was school. All right. Let's make sure we meet net school spending. With that, I yield. You owe it to us. Thank you. Mr. Coogan. Um, I just, I've got to correct Mary on one thing, and she is a good friend of mine, so I'm not trying to trying to whack you, but when the health care went back to the city, that was at the city's suggestion at the time because you said we projected a million dollars over and we were going to have to cut a million out of our budget. And I remember the conversations you said, well, Kevin over projected on health care. I said, if he over projected and you don't think we're going to lose a million dollars, then you take it back. And that's where the conversation went and you guys took it back. And I. Well, second, my second point is it's one policy for the entire city of Fall River. Now, that's to me, it's like DPW saying we'll have our own little niche over here, or the police saying we'll have ours, or the fire. You can cut the thing up 15 ways if everybody wants to call it out. But it is one policy. And um, the overall savings and benefits, whether they're through your prescription plans or whatever, benefit everybody in it. So uh, my good friend on the right also pointed out even if things get really bad, we have no ability to raise money. At least you guys do to fill some gaps in a really particularly bad year. But we're not going to have any of those. So we're going to work together to keep it where it is based on prior disagreements. Go ahead. And, and Mr. Coogan, you are 100% correct. Um, Kevin wanted to estimate health insurance significantly higher than I thought health insurance was going to come in. So he was more than happy to give it back to us <laughs> so that if he didn't meet his projections, um, it would be our problem, meaning the city's problem, to fund the remaining health care expenses for that given year. So you are right with regard to I estimated health insurance in that particular lower. gear to be lower right. um, than, than Mr. Almeida did in, in your budget. and right. so. That but was the give and take. <clears throat> correct, but it's not. And it is, it's a guess, it's, it's an it, estimate. It, please, I, I can't imagine what it's like estimating health insurance because we talked briefly in the hallway. I, I do appreciate the work you guys do, don't get me wrong. But, but it is, um, it is a, also not really a problem. It's just something that we move on to make better. It's, I mean, you, you're gonna have it with the firemen, the policemen, the teachers. It's gonna be something that's constantly moving. So I look at it as something we just keep working on to make more accurate, you know, um, I think my colleague, again, I'll give him kudos for saying maybe we have to make sure at the beginning of the year we estimate we get the right number of employees going forward and maybe it's just some tightening up like that. But, you know, please, I appreciate what both you guys do. And um, with that, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. So related to the 1.3 million in actual claims, I'm not sure I might have missed where the 1.3 was for the revenues taken out of the total package because of the grants. Is that what I heard? Yes. But then I also heard at the end that the claims for all of those individuals get sent towards net school spending. Was I either mishearing that or you, whatever you, the wording was? You misunderstood that. The only, the, on, the only amount of claims in net school spending is net of those fringe benefits that are paid for by the grants. So they articulate, like, the people that are on the grant, X amount of people, 
their claims are totally separate. It's not. Well, their claims are included in, in this particular case, their claims are included in the 21 million because all school department employees are combined together. But the 1.3 million is reimbursed, if you will, to cover the potential cost of their claims. So what <clears throat> happens if those particular people's claims are 1.7 million? These grants are written so that we only receive 1.3 million. <coughs> So the way the grants are written, the SPED grant, the Title I grant, and the Title II grant, it's written with a, with a ceiling as to the amount that can be fringe benefits. So if the fringe benefits- What if it's not accurate? It's based on your grant agreements with the state, with DESE. Do we know what the total is? We would not know the individual people who are involved here. <clears throat> right now or never? Well, we don't know, I guess, I guess Blue Cross could potentially give us that information if we asked for it. I don't know right now because the claims are broken down into the two categories, school and city. So they would be considered a school employee and so theirs would be uh, merged in with the 21 million. All right, I think that's an analysis that should be done just to, what if it's over by one, like I just said, what if it's four or 500,000 in claims for You would for those? not be able to get the money out of the grants. But right now it sounds like we don't even know that that's happening. But you wouldn't we'll be never fix it if we don't know, is my but point. But you wouldn't be able to. DESE would not approve the budget for the grant. Correct. But my point is, if we never study it to see if it's tru truly happening, then we would go to the grant, if that was happening, potentially, and say to the DESE, this doesn't make any sense. It should not be truth in advertising. This is what we're, why we take the 1.3. Is that a good number? Is it a bad number? Is it an appropriate number? I don't know. But that's analysis. I think that... And it's not necessarily on your side, Mr. Sahadi. I think it, on Mr. Almeida's side, would be to really dig into the numbers and figure out, are we close to being accurate there? Is it a lot more or less? Um, you know, I think that would be an issue. The other, just the, my final comment on whether we should take the health care back, because that's been said three or four times today. And I can be quite honest and tell you, I think that we don't have the ability to raise revenue, but I also understand the finances of what comes in from the school department and money that does come into the city. And I would perfectly well take the health care back as long as the city gave the $1.8 million in Medicaid reimbursement to the school department to put in a reserve account. I would be happy to make that motion at this meeting, at the next meeting, or any meeting, because I think that would give us the cushion that we need. So I think if we want to talk about whether we want to take it back, I think that's a discussion we should have. But I also want to have the discussion that the revenue that comes in, because it's coming out of our budget, Medicaid reimbursement is money that comes out of each one of our employees. We do the work, and we send it out, and the city gets to the tune of 1.8 million. That doesn't get factored into the net school spending 100%. So if, it, if we want to say, do we want to take it back with the ability to raise the 1.8 in Medicaid reimbursement, I'd be happy to make that motion at a future meeting. With that, I yield. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair. So my colleague raises some great points. And so just to sort of go along that, along that line of thinking. So the mayor said the city has approximately $8 million in its stabilization fund reserve. Mr. Almeida, how much does the school department have? Zero. Zero. That's because 80% of our budget is people. And so we don't, again, along those same, along that same lines, we don't have the ability to raise revenue. So having the insurance on the city side offers a number of different things for, for the school department. In that year where the projection comes in considerably over what we have in our budget for health care, mm -hmm. we don't have that ability to go into a stabilization account and make up that difference. Right. We don't have the ability to turn around and raise revenues in the last quarter of our fiscal year in order to raise that money to cover those claims. And so we're left with, as a committee, the decision to cut bodies, to cut people I'm in order sure. to, right. And so then we know historically what that's done to our district when we lay off, we give pink slips and we lay off bodies and we can't retain or we can't recruit people because there's an uncertainty about whether or not their job's gonna be stable. I think the last thing I wanna do as one person in this committee is to roll the dice each year with the difficulty that I'm hearing it is in projecting health insurance that we're gonna meet that mark. And if we don't, we lay off bodies only to next year try to hire more people to provide the services for our children that we need. It, it, it's just a bad slope to be on. now. Mr. Aguiar raises a great point. I mean, if there's other mechanisms with the Medicaid reimbursement that we could establish an account, you know, maybe that's a discussion I'd be willing to have. But without that, 
we're dipping into an operating budget on that particular fiscal year to compensate for expenses that are, that are obviously needed. People need medical care. They, right. Claims come in. I can't predict tomorrow how well or how sick our employees are going to be, but I do know that if they need to use that benefit, that's something that they are allowed to use. And so to take that out of the resources we have, I think it's a risky proposition. Um, does the city have the ability, if the health care trust fund is depleted, do they have the opportunity to put general fund money into that to sort of give it some stability? Well, if there were any general fund money, but as you know, with the zero-based budgeting, we have no- or stabilization money, excuse we would me. Be able Free cash or stabilization, right. that would be correct. We would have right. a council, we'd have to go to the city council for a vote to move, and we would have to do that because DOR would not let us- Requires a certain percentage to be in there. Exactly. Right, so, and again, to the point that I think we're making here is that we don't have that fund. We don't have that line item where we could create the health care trust fund for the school department and have money where we carry year to year. Unless there's a, a, a mechanism through state law that would allow us to create that account that I'm not aware of, I haven't seen it, it's never been proposed. I, I just, again, I think there's a number of reasons why in, it, it, it should be on the city side and, and you know, I just don't think that we should roll the dice as a committee mm -hmm. that if we're over projected that we gotta cut staff and I just think that's a bad slope to be on. Um, yeah, it, it, there are occasions where we could have excess money, and we could spend it, but I think the, the risk to the benefit is, is just not there for me. I'd rather see it stay on the city side. You know, if you need to make adjustments in the overall city budget with revenues in terms of, you know, pay as you throw, increased uh, parking meter fees, um, et cetera, et cetera, the city has the means to do that. The school department doesn't, uh, and it puts us at a distinct disadvantage when it comes to closing gaps. For us, it's real time, it's real people, um, and it has to happen quick so that we can recoup that money if it's payroll. And, and I just think it's completely disruptive to a school department to mid-year have to make those corrections and adjustment in our budget. I think it's far more disruptive for us to do that in terms of the staffing and pulling teachers out, laying them off, than it would be for the city to meet and determine what revenues you may have available to you as a city, as an entire city, rather than one department to make those changes and that have it affect everybody's budget where people are laying off. Um, that's just my, my, my take on it. I appreciate the conversation. Obviously, if, if there's an opportunity to have further conversation about it, Mr. Aggie, I raised this a point regarding you know, the, the Medicare reimbursement. Maybe we could talk more about what that would look like if that's a possibility and how would we structure it so that we have some safeguards in place in the event that health insurance was over what we had projected in a fiscal year, what money could we use to cover that without having to lay bodies, uh, you know, individuals off? Um, I'd be willing to, to have that further conversation, but I would only ask at this point, with what we have in place is that the two of you continue to communicate with one another. Let's watch these projections. If it looks as though it's coming in and we're gonna be over projected and we're not gonna mean that school spending, then we have that conversation about how to rectify that sooner rather than waiting mid-year of 2020 to try to resolve that issue. But thank you for being here, uh, Ms. Saadi, and, and thank you as well, Kevin, I yield. Thank you. One more question. Mr. Martz. How much money is in this healthcare trust fund right now? About um, I, I didn't bring that information with me, but at the beginning of this fiscal year, I believe there was 700,000 in it. How much? 700,000. 700,000. I believe. How much of that I is? I will get that for you. How much of that is for the School, so-called school department versus- 55%. 55%, so you're using a 55% figure. Thank you very much, I yield. Thank you. So we'll keep the conversation going and I appreciate the discussion. Thank you, Mary, for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, item, item number two is a discussion vote to approve the South Coast Collaborative preliminary membership. Is there other questions or are we prepared to vote? Motion to? Approve. Motion to approve is made. Second. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, roll call. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Item number three is a vote to approve the comprehensive program review audit. Motion to approve. Motion to approve has been made and seconded. Roll call, please. Uh, yes. Discussion? Discussion, Mr. Martins, on the motion. On the material provided uh, 
the administration is seeking a motion to direct the Florida School Department to conduct a special education program review. What agent, two questions, what agency is going to do this? And D, uh, DESE um, does the same, basically the same thing uh, in there. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, part of the material sent to us was this rather voluminous document. And if you go through this, it tells you what standards that you uh, met and which standards that you haven't met. If you look at CR 56, you'll see that um, every year we're required to conduct an annual review. So that you're absolutely correct. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed come down and they do a coordinated program review every six years. And as part of the coordinated program review, they do look at special education. One of those functions is, is that we conduct our own annual program evaluation. Now, many districts on an annual basis will hire perhaps a retired uh, special ed director who will come in and conduct an internal audit. It's been years since we have had a full audit in special education. There are several companies as well as individuals that do this. We would need to uh, write an RFS and go out for um, uh, companies or individuals to place a bid to come in and conduct this for us. Okay, th I understand uh, about the uh, DESI um, review. I thought it was uh, more frequent than six years, though. It's every six years that the Department of Ed come in. Okay. Uh, but this review can be done by in-house people. We it have not have to go out to. We have not. It's my recommendation at this point in time, overseeing special education, that we take a comprehensive look at our programs. So by hiring someone to come in and do that for us, they're going to look at all of the features, even more so than when the Department of Ed actually come down. So they will look at our programs that we have in place to see if we're getting a big bang for our buck. Are there places that perhaps we have some inefficiencies? Are there areas that perhaps we could save some money? And they ultimately will um, uh, not only visit our programs, they will review all of our paperwork, our documentation, and then they will uh, meet with individuals, they'll meet with special educators, they'll meet with regular ed teachers, they'll meet with parents too as well. They'll put together a report for us, and that report then will be able to be shared with the school committee. It's a nice opportunity at this point in time for us to take a look at the programs that we're now offering. Are they working for our students? So again, it's been years. We don't even know really. The last time one happened was over six years ago, and that was only one strand. That was our autistic strand that actually was reviewed. We've not um, had a review such as this in a very long time. Well, I can, I can understand that to having uh, a review of SPEC, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Quite fond of special education students. Uh, when I don't know, are you, are you going to go out for contract for this? Because it doesn't say a particular. We would need to go out to bid for it, request for services. Uh, but I one would of like the to things... know the scope of what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that, uh, yeah. while you make a good case for an outside agency, I think that you have the expertise in-house to be able to do this, provided, of course, that you don't uh, wash things or you know, sweep things under the rug with regard to you tell it exactly the way it is. If you're not doing a particular task, say it uh, in there. And uh, there should not be any reprisals because of the fact that, whoa, you're digging in a little too deep. Mm -hmm. um, All right, I yield. Thank you. Oh, on this? Yeah, sure, Mr. Corey. Yes, uh, Dr. Dargan, um, I'm, I'm looking forward very much to a review of SPED. And um, 
After getting to know you a little bit this summer and working with you side by side, I know that you're in a great position to uh, oversee this and to uh, report out, you know, what you're seeing so that we know how SPED is going to be looking going down the road. I can tell you that uh, from previous administrations, we haven't gotten SPED right yet for quite a while. So I think, you know, there's, there's a little bit of pressure there on us, on this committee, to look at SPED now, and especially we've been looking at the bridge program. I'm really proud of that. I'm, gr I'm glad that we're looking into these areas that are affected and, and need some, you know, upgrading, some revision, some new thought, some fresh thinking. So I, I, I look forward to this review. Um, I ask you in your position to uh, report out to us. Feel, feel free, you know, just send us emails, you know. Talk, talk to us here at the meetings in the future. Let us know what your findings are looking like so that we can continue to discuss, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Thank you, with that I yield. Thank you. Roll call. Friday emails. That's it, man. Mr. Aguilar. Brief, brief request. We received the document, the old program review, but in it, it indicated there was a corrective action plan on a number of cases. If we could, under an email in the future, get the corrective action plan and any results uh, thereafter. Sure. Sure. And while I have the floor, I just want to uh, mention that the second item, which is all about programming and special education for the South Coast Collaborative, my colleague to my right, Mr. Corey, worked very diligently on this with Dr. Dog and with the director of the program. So I want to give Mr. Corey his due that he did work extremely hard on this. He's really excited about this. So, uh, Mr. Corey, thank you for doing what you do on this. And with that, I yield. Thank you. Mr. Corey. Thank you, uh, School Committee Managi. I appreciate that. Um, we did, we put a lot of work. We vetted this process out very closely. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting their superintendent, Dr. David Heimbecker, uh, a true gentleman, and um, he really painted a great picture for us to be able to move forward. I'm excited about joining the collaborative. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the committee's quick vote of action on that. And um, I, I just think it's going to open up new doors for us environmentally, uh, looking at those very specialized cases in a holistic manner. And I know that uh, Dr. Heimbeck's philosophy is really thinking on the larger side of the issue. His philosophy is, is awesome. And um, when we got to talking about the matter, um, it, it just seemed to be a no-brainer for us to be able to lobby this, to move forward. And I want to thank you, Dr. Heimbecker, uh, publicly uh, for our discourse. I want to thank you, Dr. Dargan, for your open-mindedness in approaching uh, the collaborative. And I want to thank the superintendent for his open-mindedness about approaching the collaborative as well. It was a group effort, and we got it through. And I want to thank the committee again for its quick vote. Thank you. With that, I yield. Thank you. Okay, roll call on number three. Mr. Agia. Yes. Mr. Coogan. Yes. Mr. Costa. Yes. Mr. Hetzler. Yes. Mr. Corey. Yes. Mr. Martin. Yes. Mayor Correa. Yes. Thank Superintendent. You. I just want to say that what this will mean is we'll go out to RFS now and get a, uh, a request for proposals back and bring them back to the committee for approval. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, item number four is a vote to approve. Special Education Director Job Description. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion has been made and seconded. Questions? Mr. Aguiar? Yeah, if I could ask uh, through the superintendent if uh, Mr. Coogan could come up. So the current, I don't have the union contract in front of me, but um, the levels of, I want to say that this position was at the highest of two in the prior uh, individual that just left at the same level as the uh, other supervisors? Uh, I believe the supervisors are in 2D and this position is in 3A. So what was the prior person getting? And was she getting paid as 2D? No, 3A. The prior person was getting that? Correct. I think that this, um, I think Mr. Corey might have mentioned it that we haven't gotten sped right in a while. And I think one of the issues that we have uh, related to that and being in the um, chairman of the special ed subcommittee, we've had some real good discussions about the future of the program, where we're going, some regulations, or really just good discussions um, that I think are gonna turn out well in the future. But with this particular position, I think that 
having this position be in a union is a, an issue relative to um, the duties of this job. I think this job morphed from a supervisor of some type, and in the past, a special ed director ran the entire program. We required that, and we also vote as a school committee to approve these positions. And I think that there's a little bit of confusion related to um, whether this position should go back to what it was you know, 10 years ago to actually ha have the person be on an individual contract under the school committee's direction where they can actually have the authority to be a special education director. The executive director, Dr. Doggin, is also doing a whole bunch of things outside of special ed. So I think we, we would like the special ed director to have the authority to make decisions and do evaluations and the like within the special ed department, but the nature of this position, how it's currently um, advertised, I, I don't think that that necessarily allows us uh, you know, to, to get the best bang for our buck. Sort of. So I think that we need to look at this a little more before we vote, and I'll listen to my colleagues to hear their opinions, but I do think that it needs to uh, be changed a little bit. I yield. Thank you. Mr. Martins. Has this position already been filled? No, sir. It has not? No, sir. How many applications do you have? I believe there's 12 on file currently. 12? Mm-hmm. Of the 12, uh, have you reviewed those 12? Yes. It's, uh, it's a rather lengthy job description uh, in here, and uh, uh, the qualifications uh, with a master's degree in education, uh, and then the licensure, of course, and minimum of five years of administrative experience, but it does go on to say the superintendent can waive, uh, I guess, some of that uh, in there. But of those 12, do they all meet these qualifications, the, uh, the, the required qualifications? No, sir. I'm sorry? No, sir. No, they don't. Mr. Martins. Okay, if, if we, uh, uh, Mr. Martins, uh, and also Mr. Coogan, with respect to uh, uh, the applicants for the, the position, uh, there's a, I would imagine there's going to be a committee set up that will be interviewing them. That's correct. Um, and then with the, uh, when we come down to the finalists, what is the situation on that? What, do, what will you be doing? Typically in that process, we would do a pre-screening and then select the most qualified candidates or the, those candidates that meet the, the, the qualifications of the job description. Uh, then the committee would um, interview, get down to a short list, and recommend those finalists to the superintendent for a final review, and then he would bring that recommendation to this committee. Okay, uh, I would think rather than speaking about the who is qualified and who is not, I would I would suggest to the committee that that not be discussed here tonight, and that the procedure uh, be followed, whereby there would be interviews as and the the uh, finalist or the group of finalists would be recommended by the superintendent to the committee. So, Mr. Martins, I would uh, I would uh, caution the committee not to go into uh, any of the, the qualifications. Other than that, you, you certainly have the floor and you are, you are free to ask any question you, you might have. Uh, thank you, um, Attorney Sahad. Uh, so yeah, uh, I won't go into particulars, just that this is an important position and uh, the previous discussion uh, for um, auditing the special ed program uh, seems to me that perhaps there should be not only a director but uh, an assistant uh, director because this is rather voluminous uh, you know, in there. Um, with the school committee does not get to, you know, the, it end up, uh, that the recommendations three or whatever number they're going to submit to the superintendent, and the superintendent is the final uh, hiring authority. Not on this position, on the statute, the school committee I'd bring forward a recommended candidate to the committee to approve. So you rec so the recommendation that goes to the school committee. I would bring forward one candidate that I would one recommend candidate. to the committee to hire. 
see. There's three positions on the statute that the school committee hires, the head of nursing, the special education director, and then assistant superintendents. Okay. I agree with Mr. Aguiar in regards to uh, that uh, this position be a salary, a contract position, yeah, if, as if, opposed uh, Mr. to- Mr. Martins, um, I would again just caution the committee for any discussion concerning anything that might have an impact on collective bargaining uh, and that uh, would not be appropriate for, the, for an open session discussion. Okay, don't want to be violating any laws or regulations, so uh, at this point, I yield. Mr. Coogan. I don't know. I, I was going to talk to that. Um, I, okay, so hypothetically, <coughs> not with this position. Uh, this is to the superintendent. If down the road you wanted to take a position out of any union, do you have the authority in negotiations with the union to remove any position, not, not just this one? Why, why don't we do this? Let's okay, put yeah. this on another executive session agenda. Yeah. Motion to the table. Okay. I just have to be real clear. We're still posted and we're moving forward right. because I, I, uh, I, I can't hold I down to the timeline, but right. we will uh, discuss the uh, merits of the various ways to employ. But right now, we have a posting. We're, in, we're going to be starting interviewing shortly, okay. and we've got to hit whether the iron is hot because my SPED director no, I, leaves on, on January 1. No, I, I, I definitely think that okay. that's the o overarching thing, but I also understand um, my colleagues' concerns, and I want to make sure they're both addressed. That's all I'm saying. I have no problem with it. Um, I yield. <coughs> so there's a there's a motion to the table. Is there a second? May I ask a procedural question? Superintendent. The procedural question: Would the committee be of the mind to approve the job description as is, with the caveat that there'll be discussion as to where it falls down the road? Because we do need to approve this job description to hire. That's a, that's that was my point. Okay, Mr. Aguirre. So on that, I, I mean. I think that we want to get it right rather than be rushing, personally. And if we have, we, we got this before us now because we're trying to change it as a reason to, the reason why it's even on here is because we're looking to change some of the position. We modernize the language. I understand that with all due respect though, Mr. Superintendent. It's here before this committee to vote on that modified, modernized language and changes to reflect the fact that this position is so important that we shouldn't be bound by time and, and, and how many vacation days and how many days a year they can work. It's very, it's more important to me to get it right than to rush through it. And I think that what we're doing here, it says with this change, we're updating this post and due to change in staff, the change allows us to update and include new responsibilities that are now part of the position. The position currently falls within the FRA, no proposal to change the terms other than flexible scheduling. That then, uh, there's a reason why we went to flexible scheduling with certain people. And along those same lines, what I'm advocating for is I think that we need to take a breath here and say, let's, that's why I made the motion to the table, was so that we can actually see if we can get this right. And if we can do the same process, but make it a, a more appropriate individual contract, that's the thing that we should do. The other option that the committee has is just to zero it out on the budget if they, if they don't want to agree to it. And if we vote to zero it out on the budget, you can't fill the position anyway. I'm not looking to do that because I know we want to work together and try and get it done. But I, I think ultimately we need to take a, a little bit of a step back here. We looked at the last contract with the um, person. One of the complaints was um, all being on the same level, like when the hierarchy and the org chart. And I just realized today when I looked at this one, it now says it pays at 3A instead of 2D. We had discussions at the alt subcommittee right in public that said all these people were at, at level 2D or whatever it was. They were all at the same level with other administrators. So that's different information that I got just today looking at this than what we discussed at less than a month ago at a meeting. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is I think that? it's there's some issues that um, well, we can ask I have Mr. questions Coogan on. to clarify. I believe, Please do. I, I believe your question asked about SPED supervisors that are in level two, and uh, the only other SPED position I believe is in three A is the um, out of district supervisor. Right, but the. So who supervises the out of district supervisor? SPED director. The SPED director and the Who's in the same union in the same contract at the same level. Well, the that, assistant superintendent for that special That makes needs no sense, services. quite frankly. 
to have the person, and that's part of the discussion that we had at the subcommittee, was that we have the person in the, as the SPED director, that's not truly the SPED director, they're actually in the same across level with other folks that are in the union, and that became an issue. It's gonna, it should be an issue going forward for whoever applies for the job, that it doesn't make, if we had it to do right, if we wanted to truly do it right, and if anybody was being honest, they'd say that it, the right thing to do is pull this out and get it right, rather than rush it through. All right, so maybe I can re, re, recap. All I'm asking for is that the school committee approve the tasks and the qualifications, not where it falls, because that conversation can happen down the road. But the qualifications and the tasks aren't yeah. gonna change. My only response to that, sir, is that it's in the advertisement, it says where, the, where it's gonna be paid as is my point. It's That's already why been posted. I understand. So what I'm trying to do is have this committee table it so we can get it right. But and if it was posted at a, at a uh, salary range that doesn't make sense, I'd rather get it right than get it rushed. So I think, but you have to understand where we are as a district in the midst of the year. And this is a critical position for us. And if we table this, we won't be hiring until March or April. And that's a long time, and I don't want to lose the momentum that I currently have right now. We can always change where someone falls, but I need to get somebody hired, someone good. I know we have some good candidates in the pile. I'm not denying that. I'm not I want trying to get to, them hired. I'm not trying to be a fly in the ointment here with it. The other thing that we talked about at the special ed subcommittee was we talked about that being the current SPED director's last day. was happened to be the day of. It's June, uh, January was, 1. It was, it, was, it was said at the last meeting. No, it was, was her last day. We gave her a round of applause and that congratulations. That was her last meeting. Her last day is January 1. Okay, there's a motion on the table. To, there's a motion to table on the table. Is there a second? No second? Okay, we're going to continue. Mr. Coogan. No, I, I, just, I was just going to argue the point that we should fill the position, but since there was no second on the motion, then I think we just let it run along the way it is. I believe that this is, I, I have faith in uh, the superintendent and his ability to um, hire good people. If those 12 don't cut the mustard, then I'm fully in support of Kevin. Of go again. I mean, go again. We want the best people in these positions, but I do want that position filled. I think we need to start um, strengthening SPED right now. I know we did it this week up at the high school, and I know we got to keep it going or we're going to lose that department. Okay, thank you. Ms. Axler. So I think one of the concerns uh, Committee Member Aggie has is the job, not, not necessarily the job descriptions, but this cover letter, right? I mean, can we approve the job descriptions and not this cover letter? Can we do that? Is that possible? Yeah. Ask again, Mr. Hensler. My question was, can we approve just the approved job descriptions and not the cover letter? That's what we're doing, right. not the cover letter. All right, so all his concerns are on this cover letter, not necessarily the job description, right? It's in, all right, I apologize. Can we talk about this in executive session tonight? No. No. No, okay, I yield. Mr. Vice Chair. Can I just ask Attorney Assad, so if the committee took action tonight to approve a job description, it's been posted, people are applying under the four corners of this job description. Does the committee at a later date have the ability to impact bargain or collective bargain the process with the union to take it out of their union at a later date? And what, what challenges does that pose for this committee? If, if, if I'm an individual applying for this job and I think it's in the union, and then later on I'm hired for it and then I'm told by my employer that that's now changed and that you're not gonna be part of a union, you're gonna be a contract. Does that pose a problem for us okay. down the road? If, if I could, without directly answering that question, uh, just state what the, the basic uh, rules are. And the, the rule is that if you have a position in the union right now, and if the position you're advertising for or the new position that you have a job description or you've modified the de job description, if it's the same substantial duties and responsibilities, you would have to negotiate with the union in order to take that position out of the union, and they'd have every right to object to it. And if they objected to it and went to Boston for a hearing, uh, nine times out of nine, they will win uh, because it is a union responsibility, it's a union job. You would have to actually, to, 
to uh, determine a position that would be outside the union would have to have to have job duties and responsibilities substantially different mm -hmm. than what the job description is for the union individual. Thank you for that response. I yield. Mr. Aguilar. So, um, part of the part of the issue is, and I think it's just an important thing to, to put out there, that. Under the current way it's listed, I th want to say it's like a 215-day employee, or 220. So we're going to potentially, one of the reasons why I wanted to discuss this outside or change it, was that we have all other administrators that are, are working, that are in high-level positions like this that are working a lot more days. This is going to bind us to whatever's in the contract for days. So I think it's a substantially different, just numbers-wise, but separate from that, my only concern, because I tabled it, and I can understand when nobody wanted to table, that's fine. But it says on the bottom, the draft for approval of job description, approved by the school committee on draft only. Are we binding ourselves a little, just trying to be careful here, that we never approved this job description before it was advertised, or are we now able to do this at that? Just a technical, not a, um, still open. not looking for. The, the, there's no legal, th it's still open and we've done this several times, that we post a job early and we keep it open until after, and it will be open for another couple of weeks. I'm expecting actually more resumes by the time we're done. So is this, what I'm just asking technically is, is there something on there that says subject to the approval or do we now go back out and um, let those people know? Or, you know, I'm just saying, is there something on the posting to say that it's, this is subject to the new job description or is there any legal? This is what's posted. It says draft. It's what's posted. So we posted it already. We posted it as a draft. Before we pending approval, it. posted as a yeah. draft. Okay. Thank you. I yield. Mr. Martins. Uh, job descriptions on file with the respective unions. Yes. Okay. Is this job description performance responsibilities that I'm holding in my hand? Is this one? that is currently in place with FRAA. The job is currently part of the bargaining <coughs> agreement and this job description has been updated from the one that is previously in use. I don't know if you're answering my question. Is this uh, job description, performance responsibility, verbatim to what is in on file with the FRAA. The job descriptions for all positions that have been approved by the committee are on file with the HR office and they're in file at Central and that's available to all the unions. Okay, so is this the job description, performance responsibilities, is this what is on file in human resources then? No. This is a draft that's before you tonight. The job description for the SPED director is substantially significant to this job description. This is an updated version of that job description. Okay. And so that the job description is different from what is on file for a special education director currently. It is different, yes. It is an updated version. It is substantially similar, I would say. So substantially different. Similar. I'm sorry? Substantially similar, not substantially different. Oh, substantially this similar. This is an updating of the duties that, for the special ed director. What is updated? Does that make a, uh, I'll turn it aside, does that make a difference? No. Uh, Since it, it's not exactly what it was? Uh, in, terms, in terms of, uh, of whether or not the job would be a union job or a non-union job, if it is substantially similar, it certainly would be a union position. Okay. I yield. Thank you. Okay. All right. We do have a second. I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Agnew. No. Mr. Coogan. Uh, please clarify what we're voting. Uh, yes, I'm on the job description. Oh, yes. Mr. Costa. No. Mr. Hetzler. Yes. Mr. Corey. Yes. Mr. Martin. No. Mayor Correa. Yes.
What is the count? Four yeses, three noes. I'm sorry? Four yeses, three noes. So it carries. <laughs> yes, it carries. Okay. Mm -hmm. Item number uh, five, vote to approve the SLP assistant job description. Is there a vote? I mean, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Motion has been second. made. Is there a second? Second. Questions? Mr. Martins? Has this position been filled? No, sir. No. How many applications? Oh, is that a legal question to ask how many applications? You could ask how many applications, but I think that would be probably about it, uh, the extent of it, Mr. Mons. I'm sorry. I would think that you may have, you, you can certainly ask how many applications, but I think that would be the extent of the questions with respect to that. Oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you, Neil. I just want to know how many applications have been received. If this helps you at all, this is a new position, not currently in existence. We have speech language pathologists. We do not have SLPAs, the assistants for the speech so language. So this is a new position. This is a new position. New job, new job description. We currently contract this work out through an outside vendor. So the goal would be to create this job description, pull the work away from the outside vendor, save a little bit of money in doing it, and develop people who can then become speech language pathologists for the district. Do we have a speech language pathologist now? Yes. What does this individual do? They're within the FREA bargaining unit, and they do speech language services, but they are licensed. This would be for a person who is developing towards licensure. They would work under the license of our existing SLP. Well, it says here that it's to um, uh, provide services to students, but I'm trying to grasp as to, okay, what services? Is it like uh, uh, where a student uh, uh, has difficulty speaking? Correct. Exercises, services, coordinate use of uh, hearing devices as well as uh, other equipment that might aid in their therapy. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Yeah, Mr. Coogan, um, it seems that the goal is to create the position as a pathway for developing SLPs and to reduce contracted services expenses as a savings uh, by using our own employees. So. This, this is an incubator idea, it seems to me. It seems to be a good idea to incubate, to build people from within the system and to uh, orient them toward that job. So I, th I think it's a good idea myself. It seems to be an incubator, and I'm wondering if, if you may agree on that. It, it is, and, and if I might sort of expand a little bit on that, um, that person provides the actual services that are set up and put in place by the SLP. So once that person has set up the services, this person then works to help carry those out, does the services, um, helps set up with equipment, make sure that the, uh, the, the equipment's in proper use in classrooms, um, those types of services. So it's really leveraging what we have for SLPs at a savings for what we're currently paying for, for what is essentially the same position through an outside vendor. Yeah. And, then, and then we're developing our own people, hopefully. That's the goal. Yeah, and if, by developing our own people, hopefully they stick around in our district for a while. And uh, is there a realized savings with that concept? Approximately $20 an hour over what we currently pay for the outside services. 15 to $20 an hour would be a target. Um, as far as the, those services are concerned overall throughout the district, do you see the numbers or the need for those services? Are they growing or are they fairly static? One of the things that we entered into when we uh, contracted with our current vendor was the ability to do some program evaluation on how those services were being delivered, uh, get our record keeping in order, and all those things that we sort of were faced with four or five years ago when we first entered into business with this contractor. Now that those systems are in place, we can hopefully start to deliver on that ourselves and hopefully grow our own people. So it's, it's, it's an area that really it depends on the student population, the level of services that are needed, but any time we can work away from contracted services and, and be, we can. Thank you. With that, I yield, Mr. Coogan. Thank you for that. Okay, roll call. Mr. Aguilar. Yes. Mr. Coogan. Yes. Mr. Costa. Yes. Mr. Hetzler. Yes. Mr. Corey. Yes. Mr. Martins. Yes. Mayor Correa. Yes. Thank you. Item number six is a vote to approve the superintendent's evaluation timeline. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second Mr. Chair. Made and seconded. Oh, somebody already beat me, huh? That's uh, all right. Uh, <laughs>
I move to table until such time if uh, that Desi uh, comes around to. Oh wait a minute! I'm sorry. This is this is a this vote is number to six. I apologize. Wrong one. Do 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there was a motion made and seconded. Questions? Roll call. Mr. Agnew. Yes. Mr. Kubin. Yes. Mr. Costa. Yes. Mr. Hetzel. Yes. Mr. Corey. Yes. Mr. Martins. Yes. Mayor Correa. Yes. Item number seven. Votes approved. Superintendent evaluation tools. So moved. I move the table. There's a motion to the table. Is there a second? Table until such time as uh, uh, the district uh, provides the uh, district uh, uh, accountability targets. Okay, there's a motion at the table. Is there a second? Oh, hold on. Uh, this, these are just the tools. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman. These Mr. are just the tools. Is there a second? Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a second? Okay, seeing no second, is there another motion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve has been made. Is there a second? Second in discussion as well. Second, Mr. Hexler. Yeah, so this document can be changed. Um, the superintendent yeah. agrees. It says that right here. Uh, when the data comes in from DESE, those numbers will be added to this evaluation. It, it, it already says that in here. So we'll be putting those in there, and uh, the superintendent will be evaluated on this. And we could change this document at any time. That I yield. Thank you. Thank Discussion? You. Mr. Martins. While I fully understand uh, what it says here, that it can be added <laughs> at a later date, that's why I asked to have it. We'll push it off until that later date so that we're we know exactly what it is, and we don't have to argue about uh, uh, what they what they mean uh, in there. I guess, but I uh, yield. Okay, thank you. Roll call. Mr. Agnew. Yes. Mr. Coogan. Yes. Mr. Costa. Yes. Mr. Hetzla. Yes. Mr. Corey. Yes. Mr. Martin. No. Mayor Correa. Yes. Item number eight is a first read on the super superintendent's recommended budget priorities for FY20. Superintendent. So, I've worked for the last uh, month on looking at the future needs of the school system. Uh, I've done surveys with principals and K-12 directors. I've held several meetings. I've talked with my finance team. Uh, and we're looking at next year's uh, recommended budget priorities as one, maintaining current levels of human capital at each school, and that includes the K-3 to uh, uh, class size push that we've had. Two, invest in instructional technology. I think I've heard that from many members of the committee oh, as yeah. well, both hardware, software, and then the human capital. We're looking at, if I have the ability to add uh, more uh, integration specialists at the site level uh, to help with the technology uh, infusion in the classrooms. Then three, invest in the academic district support. So that's around the curriculum alignment and program coherence. It's around Mr. Martins will be happy. Uh, instructional paraprofessionals and school-based funds for instructional interventionists where schools would be given funds to hire retirees to help also provide interventions. Three, SEO programs and supports for tier two intervention. Four, targeted supports for ELL and SPED because we don't know what those will be yet, but because we see what the numbers are, but those would be uh, bodies and programs uh, to support uh, both an increase in ELL, but also uh, as we continue to refine special ed. And then we're looking at the adoption of a district-wide phonics program. Yes. We feel strongly that the early literacy is, is really critical and we don't have one in place and that's something that we need. Yes. The fourth investment that we're looking at is district-wide curriculum leadership. Uh, thinking about ELA, math, and science. We have district-wide leadership in arts and phys ed, but we don't have ELA, math, and science. Uh, and those are the areas that are, that are we're held accountable to on the state accountability system. So we have people that work in buildings, but I don't have district oversight. So that's something that we're gonna be looking at. And then, of course, invest in the next generation summative assessment platform that we've talked to you about moving beyond what we currently are with TestWiz. I think that you're, vision to approve the position that uh, Dr. Curley is in has been a, a huge boon to the district. So we now had designated support and research assessment and evaluation, and we'll be moving away from test whiz, as that's a, really a 20th century platform, moving to something that's much more next gen, uh, and, and, and looking at uh, 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 bringing that back to the committee for approval as part of the budget process. And then finally, of course, 
Our priority is to invest in district-wide operations, safety and security being foremost, but then also maintenance and preventative maintenance. Transportation is we can look at the, uh, the bidding process to get those costs down and then capital expenses. Uh, you know, continue to look at areas where we need to get ahead uh, uh, and manage. Uh, so those would be the priorities that my team uh, feels confident that when I'm developing the recommended budget to the school committee, that these are things that we look at if there is money and funds available to be able to invest in. I don't know what the tea leaves say on the governor's budget yet, but I know revenues are up. And I also know that with the work on the Foundation Budget Review Commission, uh, uh, I think we may see uh, greater uh, 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 stress relief from those changes. So if there are monies available as I build this budget, these are the areas in terms of line items that I'm going to be looking to prioritize as I bring forward. I bring this to you as a first read uh, and to bring back the committee uh, for, a, for a vote of approval given your feedback uh, in an upcoming meeting because, again, what I, the way I like to do things is not just do things and say here they are. I want to get the input of the committee in terms of as I'm, before I even give you guys our proposed budget that you have input on the prioritizing of goals. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I ask through you to the superintendent? I mean, I'm all in favor of the district-wide phonics program. I think it's sort of the building blocks of the foundation for literacy, and I think that we should go back to those days where we're teaching phonics in our classrooms. But, and I don't know if this is tied to it or not, but is it, maybe we can talk about it in the future, but is it possible to bring back cursive is that possible? So is, it, is that, it, and I say, I say a great that question with all ask. sincerity. I don't know how many times my kids come home with forms and it says student signature. They don't know how to sign. Yeah, we, we, they uh, don't know we, how to write cursive. How do they, I, how do they so, so they it, press it, his name. Yeah. We've, lost, we've lost that off. So in, in addition to phonics, can we talk a little bit about how we go back to well, teaching we, cursive, we at do, least the elementary grades? And we so do that, units of study in cursive, I know, but I've asked the same question myself because my own kids went through the... You know, my daughter goes to Catholic school now, and the first day she had to do a report in cursive, and she looks at me and says, I don't know how to write cursive. What is that? Right. <laughs> right. And so, so I, again, I why just think we, Why don't we put, put that on the agenda for the instructional subcommittee meeting that we have coming up? Oh, well, maybe that can happen there. We can discuss it again. I don't think it's a big ticket yeah. item, but I think, you know, we, we've gotten away from a number of these, you know, a number of educational issues over the years for various reasons, and I think Cursive's one of those, and I just think that how do you earn a paycheck? You got to sign your name. Like, if I can't sign because I don't know how to, how do I sign my paycheck? <laughs> so, and X doesn't cut it because I could be X, you could be X, and four people on this table could be X. So, well, split um, the check. I, I just, I, you know, again, it's a small thing. I know okay. several years ago we had someone here, parents, advocating to bring that back, and I really feel like it's a lost art, and and it'd be a, a small ticket item, and we should consider having that. With that, I yield. Mr. Exler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just, we have our your budget priorities here, and I definitely, one thing I'd like to do is reduce the out of district spending. I don't know if there's a way you can increase uh, programs here in the city. Well, that, I, know, I, I know we mentioned that a little bit, but I mean. It's number D. Right, and I know the speech language pathologist that's going to reduce some out of district. So I, I just want to continue to see those out of district placements and tuitions and the transportation that comes along with it be reduced. That I yield, thank you. Motion to approve the first read. Hold on, there's a few other. Uh, Mr. Martins. About a, well, Superintendent, you've been here for two years, three years. This is my years. third budget cycle. Okay. Um, about a year <coughs> or two before that, this committee voted to introduce cursive writing in elementary grades. Which we you do. You can look that up if you wish uh, in there. And I don't know if that has taken place or not, but it was voted to have that implemented in elementary grades. Uh, in there. Uh, to have your driver's license, you need to have a signature. People and kids can't write their own name, which is a shame. Um, so I would consider that as uh, an item to put on to the you know, recommended uh, budget priorities. In addition to that, uh, adding 
invest in emergency, I'm sorry, invest in emerging career programs. Uh, you have a sentence here that you look forward to your feedback, Bo. That's feedback. I appreciate that feedback, Mr. Martins. I've added three programs since I've been superintendent. <laughs> and I'm still waiting for that pizza you promised me. I'm sorry? <laughs> I, I said I'm still waiting for that pizza you promised me. I've added three programs since you hired me, and I told I, you I, I would. I don't think I promised. I pr you I promised her I a promised dinner. You got me a pizza. Your assistant, uh, superintendent, like the that if you increase the... Uh, you know, that was the, that uh, was a promise uh, you made this year. By ten percent <laughs> for English, grade ten, English language arts, math, and science. Yeah. So uh, let me, CPI. Let me just say this to you, Mr. Martin. You know, buy the, the meal, uh, lobster dinner. Thank you. And, but not a pizza. I didn't think. Here, I here's. I don't have it here be, because I didn't want to add too much. But I know in next year's budget, I have to add the marketing position because that will be full time next year. So that's a CBT. E chapter 74 position. So you, we are investing in emerging career pathways. We're up to That's eight. Fun. And you know we got the application out for uh, construction craftsman uh, tech right now, and that may add one. So I mean, I think we're doing all the, the right things in CVTE and continue to build program. Hospitality management is a good one too. I got a weird, to adding I got, to yep. the local economy. We have to. We're going to be looking at all that. And I know BCC is an amazing program that kids can funnel right into. But I got to, you know, it's not as easy as it used to be. We got to get permission from the state, and we'll, we'll keep going down that path, Mr. Martins. I'm, I'm with you on that train. I don't want you to think I'm not with you on that train. So you and I you ride the train. For, you asked for feedback. I just gave you some. I love it. Invest in emergency. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, emerging career <coughs> programs, and also on uh, following up of, of Mr. Coster on seeing that the uh, cursive instruction uh, that was voted by the committee uh, back maybe three or four years ago. Let's see if that has actually taken place. I yield. Thank you. Mr. Corey. Okay, Mr. Martins uh, stole my thunder. <laughs> that was good. That was a good discussion. But um, I was going to ask the superintendent, um, when, when, when we're saying that we're investing in instructional technology, uh, Dr. Malone, um, I was going to ask about the growth, uh, a report out on CVTE and how that's looking and moving forward. I know you got your thumb on the pulse. I know we've had discussions about it, but I want to continue to be a vocal advocate for the growth and development of CBTE programming in our schools. And if we could look at the growth and development of those programs at the middle school levels moving into the high school, then that would be even a, a greater breeding ground to develop our students uh, for 21st century career pathways. So yes. could, could you explain? So yeah, just like what, you, what your basic oh, ideas I mean, are. I, our, our vision for this is that we do push down in the middle schools. We continue to grow, and we get a lot more uh, hands-on, practical stuff going on at the yeah. middle school. You know, with the elementary schools, we're doing much more with the maker spaces now, getting kids doing much more hands-on stuff. But the middle level, we need wood shop. We need. Uh, I'd like to see us even using the, you know, more of the uh, design principles with the laser cutters and and and, and all of those at the middle level. So. It's going to take a while, but this is the road that we're going down. And the more we invest in CVTE, as Mr. Martins has been so astute in, in telling people, is it's more money in the weighted Chapter 70 foundation. So that's reinvestment that we put back into uh, more programming. So it makes even more sense. So it, 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 and it's just something that, it, that we're fully focused on. But again, it, 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 you know, you've, in, in two and a half years, we've added three programs. So what's going to happen in... Two more years, so I, you know, I'm encouraged that you guys are so supportive of this. It's, it's, uh, it's just, you know, it, you know, and if the F, if the foundation budget review commission gets fixed, you know, the, on the hill, that that would give us a ton of opportunity to do much more, putting some some real hands-on uh, CBTE-like programs at the middle level. So we have our sights on that as well, Dr. Yeah. Malone. You know, so um, yeah. I'm really pleased. I think overall, uh, the recommended budget priorities, the list is comprehensive. It looks good to me. Nothing's ever perfect in a public school system, but uh, I like the direction that we're looking to uh, move forward to in the future. With that, I yield. Thank you. Is there a motion? Motion, motion to. Okay. 
Is there a second? Second. Okay. Can you roll call? Yeah, roll call. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Item number nine is a vote to approve the first quarter revolving fund. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Questions? Mr. Martins. Where is the circuit break of money placed right now? <laughs> it's uh, 4350, Mr. Martins, the last account that you see there. Yeah, I see that as far as there, but uh, uh, <laughs> what's it being used for at the present time? Tuitions. I'm sorry? Tuitions. Tuition. All of it? Yes. Okay, so it's not going elsewhere other than the school department? No. Super. Thank you very much. I yield. Okay. Roll call. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Item number 10 is a vote to approve the year to date budget report. Moved. Motion. Moved. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Questions? Second. Questions? Roll call. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. There are a number of items for your information. <coughs> Motion to accept and place on file. Motion has been made to accept and place on file. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Any new business this evening? Okay. I'm going to request an executive session for this evening. Just point of order, Mr. Chair, if I can make a motion to accept the addendum as part of that. Okay. Motion has been made to accept the addendum as part of tonight's executive session. Is there a second? second? Roll call, please. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. And uh, a motion to go into executive session for the following reasons, which will now be read by Attorney Assad. Okay. Based on the authorization from the chair, Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A7, to review and approve executive uh, session committee minutes for the November 13, 2018, regular meeting of the Forever School Committee. Also, Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all maintenance employees of the Forever School System represented by the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 93. Local 1118, as the chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. Uh, Mass General Laws, Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all government program employees, including without limitation paraprofessionals, parent workers, and clerks of the Forever School System that are paid from federal slash state grants and represented by the Forever Public Schools government programs, as the chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. Also, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A1, to review the open meeting law complaint dated December 5, 2018, filed by Colin Dias, right, regarding allegations at the Forward School Committee, uh, at the school committee meeting of November 13, 2018, and the Forward School Committee and the mayor, Jason F. Correa, second, violated Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20A, Meetings to be open to the public and Section 20G, uh, the chair's right to remove a person who disrupts a public meeting. Also, National Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A1, to review the open meeting law complaint dated December 5, 2018, filed by Colin Dias regarding allegations that at the Forever School Committee meeting of November 13, 2018, the Forever School Committee and Mayor. Jason F. Correa II violated National Law Chapter 30A, Section 20G, disruption of the proceedings of a public body. Also, Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A1, to review the open meeting law complaint dated December 5, 2018, filed by Colin Dias, regarding allegations at the Forward School Committee meeting at the School Committee meeting of November 13, 2018. Forward School Committee and Mayor Jason F. Correa II violated the open meeting law when Chairman Jason F. Correa communicated with the superintendent of schools. Also, Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A1, to review the open meeting law complaint dated December 7, 2018, filed by Colin Dias regarding the allegations that the Forward School Committee 
at the Forward School Committee meeting of November 13, 2018, the Forward School Committee and Mayor Jason Left Career II violated the open meeting law when Chairman Jason Left Career II did not state the purposes of executive session, did not announce whether the open session will reconvene, but instead instructed and authorized legal counsel to the school committee to state the purposes of the executive session and to announce that the school committee uh, would reconvene in open session. Uh, we will, we would, re uh, uh, the school committee will go into executive session. We will reconvene. There may or may not be statements at that time. Um, Roll call, please. Let's go into executive session. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Carrera? Yes. Okay. School committee meeting will come back to order. Roll call, please. Mr. Agnew? Here. Mr. Coogan? Here. Mr. Costa? Here. Mr. Hetzler? Here. Mr. Corey? Here. Mr. Martin? Here. Mayor Correa? Here. Any uh, items out of executive session? Any action? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the executive session committee minutes for November 13, 2018 of the regular meeting of the Forest School Committee. Okay. Second. 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 Roll call. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Any other motions? To adjourn, Mr. Chair? Motion to adjourn has been made. Is there a second? Second. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Co uh, Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Absolutely. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mayor Correa? Yes. Okay, meeting is adjourned. Have a great night.